All right. Good evening. Welcome, guys. We're at the uh, 91st installment of the Playing to Win uh, podcast series. I'm joined today with Mackin Murphy. How are you doing, Mackin? Hey, how are you? So a uh, quick backstory on how we connected. Um, as one does on the interwebs, uh, you know, perusing um, the algorithms had sent me something from um, our young friend here, and he was talking about uh, things in the manosphere, the red pill advice, uh, and he's a scientist uh, from Oxford currently. Uh, I think you're lecturing in Australia, if you can maybe clarify that. Yeah, so I do a little bit of lecturing here um, as a, basically I run tutorials, but my main gig is that I'm doing a PhD at the University of Melbourne. So I finished my MSc at Oxford, and now I'm at Melbourne doing similar research. Cool. Um, seems like a well-versed guy, pretty smart, L was watching a bunch of his, uh, clips and followed him on Twitter. And I got a DM almost instantly, uh, asking for a debate, a conversation on a podcast. So here we are. Um, I think you'll probably find that we, uh, agree and disagree on a bunch of stuff. I think he's going to come at this from more of a science, uh, perspective. My, I guess a lot of the content that I put out guys, it, it's, it's based on studies. It's based on Evo psych. It's based on watching human behavior. It's of course, based on my experience in, uh, uh, you know, consuming content from the man swamp, uh, red pill sort of stuff. Um, so I'm, so I'm a little bit broader and I've sort of grown and evolved as times pass as I believe one should and update our belief systems. I know that Mackin has, uh, recently read my book. Um, you had some warm things to say about it and some not so warm things to say about it. Why don't we start with the book? What did you think of the book? Well, I mean, I think that a lot of your advice, I think that we'd be repeating a lot of the same things. If, you know, a man was asking, okay, what can I do to succeed better on the mating market? Mm -hmm. A lot of just the raw advice we'd say a bunch of the same things. It's like, yes, focus on yourself, right? So it's it's not a chasing game, it's a building game. Uh, it's about the traits that you bring to the table more so than, you know, just pursuing and pursuing and pursuing. So the, the idea of like, yes, women care about looks, so you should try to be good looking and hit the gym and get your fashion in order. Yes, women care about money. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, you should be trying to make money if you're ambitious romantically. Uh, yes, women care about status. I mean, I would add some things that you that you probably uh, that you may or may not agree with, um, yeah. but th that would be a list that we would have in common. T to be honest, though, mate, the overall attitude towards women mm -hmm. in the book and in your other work, it's just something that I don't relate to at all. Uh, like, Why I, is I just. That? I mean, like even scrolling through your Twitter, like saying things like 90% of women have nothing to offer in relationships. Like I was just, I was just reading it before I came mm -hmm. on, like 90% of women have nothing to offer in relationships, but sex, um, women are sex objects, right. Uh, making fun of Taylor Swift's body. Like this is stuff that like, <laughs> I just don't relate to it at all. It, yeah. It's, it strikes me as very harmful and it's, you know, I mean, to, to be to be a hundred percent frank, it grosses me out. Like it's just like I I I I, I can barely read it. But then on the other end, it's like I, I do think there's a baby in the bathwater. Um, uh -huh. We do we do have a lot of commonalities in the sense that we wouldn't just tell someone, oh, just be yourself. Um, and we also wouldn't we wouldn't be a fan of people whining about the mating market and saying, Oh, it's unfair that women want these things or, Oh, it's unfair that guys want these things. And then just hoping that someone will come along and scoop mm. them up. That's uh anyway, I, I, I'm sure that I'm getting tons of comments from your audience. I'm coming on your platform here. So I'm sure that I'm getting tons of simp and white knight and that kind of thing. And uh, I'm totally comfortable with that. I, I, I don't need to be liked. No, that's, that's uh look, man. I mean, you know, the internet is what the internet is and it, and it, yeah. and it says and does things that it does. And, uh, you know, you have to learn how to leverage it too. That's, that's, um, that's one of the skills that I sort of picked up a few years ago from Ryan, from Ryan Halliday. He was the author of, uh, you know, quite a few books and he got started when he was working for a clothing company. I think it was American apparel or Abercrombie and Finch or something. He just talking about like, look, you know, if you're going to use social media, if you want to get reach, you have to talk about things in, in such a way that it gets people's attention so that they want to talk about it or engage in it. And it's a fine line with social media today, because if you go too far, then you can get banned or deplatformed. And if you're not salacious enough, then you don't get any attention at the same time. So you and I operate in different realms. You operate in the scientific realm, and I try to get people's attention on conversation pieces that I have. Uh, so sometimes, I guess, flicking boogers at certain people is necessary to 
uh, create a little bit of outrage and attention on it. So that's what I do. It, and th that's how I do that stuff with uh, stuff, especially like Twitter. Um, so well, well, you, you've outraged me a few times. So it's working. excellent. Excellent. Well, it was enough that as soon as I followed you, like literally within about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I got a DM from you asking for a yeah, immediately. So, immediately. So, well, here's the thing is that I get, I mean, if you go on my TikTok, right, every time yeah. I go viral, I get tons of comments just saying, oh, you're, you're scared to talk to someone from the red pill, you know, yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. you won't you and it's like, I'm not scared to have a conversation, mate. Like, yeah. it, it, it's totally fine. But every everyone I reach out to, it's like, I, I respect you for being the first person uh, willing to willing to touch me with a 10 foot pole because, yeah. you know, Rolo Tomasi has been uh, been ignoring me, even though he, you know, replies to my other stuff. He, uh, you know, he he's a bit of an alpha male there and uh, a bit too alpha <laughs> for a conversation, I suppose. What's the um, what's the gripe? What's the um, issue that um, people seem to have with you on TikTok and, you know, like the red pill or like the narratives that are that are discussed in that space? Well, it's kind of weird because I get hate from both sides, right? I, I mean, I, I don't, I, the red pill, blue pill, black pill. I mean, it, it, it just sounds like people talking about their favorite color Power Ranger to me. Yeah, let's uh, talk about uh, pills for a minute. Like, what do you think about all these colored pills that are all labeled now? I think it's, I think it's weird to approach life trying to expect that you can sort it into ideologies in, the, in this like neat way. Um, it's not how I operate. I... I mean, I, I know that a lot of people are just not going to believe that this is true, but people in my personal life will tell you that it is. It's I believe whatever the mainstream science and, and in some niche cases where I think the mainstream science is wrong, it's because I think there are specific studies that are very, very compelling. Mm -hmm. And and that leads me to disagree with a lot of mainstream red pill points. Mm -hmm. It leads me to have kind of a nuanced take on certain ones. It leads me to outright agree with some, right? Like if we were talking, like if I, if I was talking to someone who's, you know, thoroughly blue pilled, if that's even a thing, mm. um, they would tell me, oh, you know, just again, what we were talking about, like, oh, just be yourself, right? Mm. Or oh, looks don't matter, right? Or oh, it's just it's just a stereotype that money is attractive, right? Mm. Like th th this is just nonsense. There, there's there's decades of research showing that that's not true. And then, you know, there, there, there's some people, most of my comments are people misinterpreting me as someone who's just, I mean, it depends on what I'm going viral for. I mean, sometimes people are, you know, calling me an incel and saying that I'm black pilled and it's like, all right, I'm not an incel and I'm, I'm, I'm a hardly black pilled. I just think that the data is in and looks matter. Right. And, and, and sometimes it's people saying that I'm, that I'm a, you know, a simp and a cuck um, because I don't believe that, I don't know that what would be a good example of like a non red pill belief I have that, that I, that I believe that body count matters for men as much as women, or that I believe that in terms of dating prospects, it's, it's actually quite uncommon for a woman to mess up her dating life by having too much, uh, you know, sexual encounters in practice. It's like, that doesn't seem to be that much of a hurdle or, or mm. I wouldn't believe that say, I, I wouldn't believe in something like the wall, like this idea that like, this like overnight, I, I mean, we can get into all the the detailed things. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I saw think that you, you sort of define the wall as more of a slope than a definite smash into a hard object that stops their prospects. Yeah, I mean, it would be weird if it was. a. Uh, I mean, it's like that's not that's not how aging mm -hmm. works. It's like, yes, over time, romantic prospects in terms of your mate value over time that declines. In men, it starts to decline at a significantly later point than it does in women, mm -hmm. but it declines in both cases, right? Um, like Rich, I'm sure you know that you probably had more options when you were 40 than you do now, right? Um, like, I, I I don't think that's something you disagree with. You're actually one of the more, frankly, I mean, I, I don't want to just argue with you or, or discuss things with you as if you're just a representative for the entire red pill, right? Uh, some of well, I mean, we talked about this in DMs, so we can clarify. So yeah. you're asking about that, and you know, I am what I would consider red pilled, but yeah. I am not identifying with any pill in particular. I have become frustrated and exhausted with the notion of of pills because people invent new pills to uh, label whatever belief they want to broadcast or sell to you, especially on you know social media and YouTube. So if the so if the red pill isn't your thing, then you conjure up a white pill or a purple one or an orange one or you know something like this to brand and market whatever it is that you're selling. To me, it's it's simply you know what is truth and what is lies, right? And interpretation of truth 
for me, because I'm a little bit older and have some more experience, I, you know, I look at human behavior. I look at what I've read in Evo Psych, and I've probably read close to as much as you have. Um, not to the same degree. I haven't studied, I haven't researched, I haven't put out papers like you have, obviously. And I've, I've, I've summarized a lot of my thoughts in a, a book um, and in content that I've put out. But I don't really like the whole, you know, let's be red pilled or, or you're blue pilled or if they disagree. Like I've seen people in the Mano Swamp call guys like David Buss uh, blue pilled. And I don't think he's blue pilled. I think he's a scientist that's researched some uh, great, you know, put some good work together and put out some very informative and useful books. And, um, you know, to call somebody that's that's put out useful information blue pill almost seems like it's disparaging at this point. Um, so I don't like the whole pill label labeling stuff. I think it's, you know, what is actually working and what's useful that you can apply to your life and what is just, you know, comforting lies to sort of satiate you to happy wife, happy life, you know, your way through a marriage, you know, sort of thing would be a very simple example to sort of put out there. Um, what do you think of the notion of that statement? Something like happy wife, happy life. Like, how does that sit with you? <laughs> well, I've never been married. Uh, so, but happy wife, happy life as a statement. I mean, is that, I mean, is that a belief that you would subscribe to? Would you, were you to get married? No, not really. I mean, I, I think that I think that things are a little more complicated than that. I think that part of the underlying sentiment is probably true that if your mm. relationship is going well, if the home is happy, it's I, I, I mean, yes, it's it's I, I think that to an extent that's true. But the idea that, mm. you know, I saw you talking about like Tyson Fury just saying that, you know, he should agree, agree, agree to avoid conflict. I, I don't think that that's a well supported way towards a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but again with the pill stuff it's like the other end of it for me is that it just sounds so childish to talk about truth in this way it's like my pill's right your pill's mm -hmm. wrong like that kind of thing it's like i'm um, red pill black pill blue pill again it's kind of like the power ranger thing it's like what what are you guys doing it's like yeah. it's just it's, it's just there's just individual facts and you assess them based on you know not not what your favorite sports team is right you're rooting for the red pill rooting for the it's like is the does the evidence support it or not Right. Mm -hmm. And and I get buffeted around on certain points. Right. Um, for example, like when I was an undergrad, the I, there was there was this idea that was that was very common in the literature and very well supported at that time um, or relatively well supported. The support seems to seems to be kind of illusory in hindsight. But this idea that women's preferences shift quite significantly during ovulation versus mm -hmm. outside of ovulation. That was Isn't just that a, that was, through Marty Hazelton studies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, yeah. so you have read a little bit. Yeah. 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 yeah so there, book, or, or I've listened to yeah, it. Yeah. 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 So Marty Hazelton and also, you know, Steve Gangestad, um, a little bit of Randy Thornhill. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could, li I could list authors. It wouldn't, mm. it wouldn't really matter. But the point is that there's this huge body of research basically suggesting that women's preferences shift dramatically at ovulation or they shift quite significantly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there was some rep and, and so that was just that was just what I believed because that's where the studies were, right? Mm. Um, but then, you know, over time, it kind of turns out that when you do better studies with better methodology, right? The early studies maybe had they were underpowered, small sample sizes. And then mm. also the effect sizes weren't necessarily um well, it was really the the methods of measuring when someone's ovulating. They they had low validity. Uh so it was like having women count from their latest period right? Mm -hmm. Which, which isn't the best method. And when you do newer methods with larger samples, sometimes there's an effect, but when there is an effect, it's small. So mm -hmm. that's a great example of like, for me, it's just, okay, what is the current best evidence we have show? And so it's like, if you asked me when I was 19, 20, right? Okay. What, what's, what's the evidence on ovulation shifts? I would say it's looking pretty good. Right. And then you ask me now, right. Um, several years later, and it's like, all right. I mean, uh, the, the the best replication attempts haven't seemed to work very well. The biggest meta analyses are are you know they're they're competing. There there are some that say there's a small effect and some that, that say there's no effect. But overall, you know, my opinion has changed. So that's really where I come at things. It's not it's not just what what you because know, you know red pill would say oh ovulation studies they rock they're awesome they're true right. Mm -hmm. It's like okay. Blue pill guys would say, oh, you know, the ovulate, oh, it's a myth, da, 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 da. And it's like, oh, it's, it's not really a myth. Uh, that's that's not a good word for something that science has been investigating. Mm -hmm. But I would just say, okay, what, where's the best evidence right now? And then that's mm -hmm. my opinion. See the, the, um, see, the problem that I've come to realize with scientific research as guys like you 
um, use them is that it it relies on a lot of the times there are surveys, right? So a real good example was, um, you know, Alexander uh, from Date Psych. Um, yes. I had him on my channel at one point and we were talking about his research on top deal breakers in dating. Yep. Um, and as we were going through, uh, women's deal breakers and men's deal breakers, I came to realize there's, there's like 25 or 30 deal breakers that women would list when, you know, he surveyed them. But do you know what was missing? That was obvious to me. Oh, it's the behavior. I mean, that, uh, right. No, I mean, no, I, I, no, I think no, it's I uh, height. About. It's height because. Oh, they didn't say height. None oh, of the women so in the survey acknowledged that height was important, but women disqualify men routinely on dating apps if they look short or uh, if they aren't tall enough for them. So it's interesting, you know, to, um, you know, get into the science and the research and say, you know, well, you know, this is this is science based evidence on, uh, you know, good advice for dating and stuff like that. But when you ask somebody for their opinion or to take a survey or, you know, however it's presented to them, like maybe you need a lie detector attached at the same time when you're asking them the question yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? That's not even, yeah. So I, I can, like it can be flawed. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, survey data generally isn't good enough to believe something, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a very similar example of this. So you have to, when I am assessing whether something's true, ideally, and sometimes the evidence just isn't there. Sometimes it is, it's like, okay, we've, we've got survey data and nothing else. So it's like, it's between survey data and like personal experience. And it's, okay, maybe we need to do more research here. But when it's good, right? We get survey data, but we combine it with behavioral data. And then also stuff that's kind of in between. So for example, with the height thing, right? You could look at what height filters do women set on dating apps, right? It's kind of in between. It's not quite behavioral. I guess you could say setting a filter is a behavior, but it is a self-report of their preference, but it's a self-report in a higher stakes context. So it's more persuasive. A good example of this would be if you ask people, and this is true for men and women, right? If you ask people, okay, what do you want in a mate? They're going to tell you, oh, I want someone honest. I want someone loyal. I want someone kind, right? Mm -hmm. And and they probably do want those things, right? Those are those are the those are the top three and uh, you know top four types of traits. Usually, the top five are all these like personal qualities that are quite important. But if you look at behavioral data, looks come out over and over again, right? At oh, close no to question. the top of the list, if not the top. Right, exactly. So, so it's like, yes, you say you want someone honest, loyal, and kind, but then when you actually go to select mates, what's the first thing you're, you're looking at? You're looking at looks and you're filtering based on that. Now, some would say, okay, that doesn't mean that looks are the most important thing. It's just the easiest thing to filter people based on. But I would say that when you look at especially another behavioral way of getting at this is to look at partner correlations, right? So for example, Men say that they don't care that much about a woman's education level, mm -hmm. right? So you look at the, you talk about the self-report. So I, I just said a self-report example that would be, you know, very red-pilled. Here's one that's, well, it kind of goes the other way sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Men say they don't really care about a woman's education level. But then you look in practice and almost every college educated man is only dating women who are also college educated, right? Correct. Yeah. The, the, so the, the inter- I actually had a, women, um, I actually had a gal on my uh, Ladies Night podcast the other night, and she's in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she was telling us that she was disqualified almost routinely sometimes by guys that were higher income earners because she didn't have a degree and didn't earn enough money. Yes, exactly. So, so a lot of these red pill guys, right? They'll say, "Oh, it's not just you know, survey data isn't real. Survey data isn't real." And it's like, okay, let's look at some behavioral data. Yeah, you you guys are right. Looks matter a lot more than women say, right? Mm -hmm. But education, status, money. In practice, men say men say they don't care about these things when you ask them on a survey. But then in practice, men are dating roughly in their own income, especially in the West, right? And this this really is Western data, um, roughly in their own income range, right? Definitely in their own class range. If you were to stratify the sexes um, based on you know normal variation in how the sexes earn. Mm. And then also definitely in their education range. We don't see these big mismatches. So mm. yes, I completely agree. It also, with you. It also depends on, on who you're going to ask to and where they're at in their stage of life. Like if you're talking to an older, more seasoned gentleman that's that's got his money sorted, 
he probably doesn't really care that much about her education and a degree on the wall and more about youth and beauty and potentially if he wants a family and children, fertility, right? So um, these things all seem to be moving targets in my estimation. Is that something that you would agree with or disagree with? I think you'd be surprised, mate. I believe it's true for you, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that as when we're putting on, when we're trying to be critical thinkers, right? We have to step outside of our own preferences and our own experience, right? Because I would have some bias biases based on what I, there are times when I, you know, open up a study and I'm like, well, I, you know, I really care about this thing. Mm -hmm. And then I realize, oh, it seems like actually overall, this isn't something that's super important to other men and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I would say that most men who are educated, whether they say it or not in their behavior, they exhibit a preference towards other educated um towards other educated individuals. And part of this, it might not, it might not come out as a direct effect. You, you have to keep in mind that it's like, if you're, uh, as you say, like, like a guy who's got his money together, educated, that sort of thing, you're probably a pretty smart guy, right? Just, just probably mm -hmm. very few people get rich by accident, right? There's yeah. some people who get, get it through inheritance, that kind of thing. But usually it's like, okay, you've been solving complicated problems at a high level for decades. And that's why you have money. That type of guy in practice, he, you know, in, in his speech, he might say, oh, I don't care about our education level. I don't care about how smart he is. Da, 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 da. I just want someone young and beautiful. And then it's like in practice, you know, you're on the second date and you're bored because you guys can't talk about anything. Um, so I, I think a lot of these guys, they, they say they don't care about it, but they do. We don't see huge IQ mismatches in dating. Typically, we don't mm -hmm. see huge um, salary gaps in dating. Typically, um, although you know this is when you're correcting for already the differences in wage gap, um, the differences in wages between the sexes. I apologize. And then also we don't see these huge gaps in education. Generally, people mate quite assortively on that. Even though it's it's if it, if it's going to go up in one direction, yeah, it's generally the women dating up. Would you? I mean, I would. I would look at that uh, and, you know, essentially respond with the vast majority of the population out there when they approach relationships and dating and uh, long term type of engagements, um, they generally subscribe to society's um, narratives. Right. And we've generally been told throughout our lives, I mean, mine anyway, I'm, I'm again, you know, a bit older that, um, you know, you want to find somebody who's your equal, you know, who you can stand beside, who you can uh, build something with together, um, not find somebody that's, I mean, they certainly tell women, I mean, they don't even need to tell women this, this is almost in their DNA because they're hypergamous and they always look for somebody that's at least at the same socioeconomic status. Actually, let's talk about hypergamy before we keep going. Yeah, we can, you, get, we can get a little, we can get a little, you, a little messy there as well. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with the godfather of the manosphere with his assessment of hypergamy? And uh, I think we've heard Jordan Peterson sort of co-sign it as well too. Like, is there any disagreement that you have with the notion of hypergamy? Well, I'm I'm part of one of the only evolutionary psychology labs that uh, uh, that ever even considers hypergamy or looks mm -hmm. into it. It's okay. definitely, I would say that there is a phenomenon there, but you have to be more precise with your terms, right? No, I'm not saying you specifically. I'm yeah, saying okay. that red pill folks, they kind of, they kind of gerrymander hypergamy around whatever dating situation they like, right? What so does that like, mean? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the term gerrymander and the no, oh, uh, well, it might, be, it might be kind of a niche United States term, but it's when politicians redraw the maps okay. so that way the votes are skewed um, okay. towards there. So it's like it's like an ex post fact. I'm saying that ex post facto, right after the fact, they're reconfiguring the situation so hypergamy explains it. Okay, so, so shoot the arrow and then draw the target around where it lands. That's a much better way of saying it. Thank okay. you for thank you for helping me out with my analogy there. This is what I do, my friend. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah. So the, so look, yes. Um, I would say that there, there are, there are several ways in which, um, women seems to aim up, um, more than men. Right. Mm -hmm. So for example, I mean, I remember Helen Fisher, who, who's really the world's most cited expert on romantic love. She, or, or, or certainly the, the, the one that that's talked about the most, I don't know if she's officially most cited, but she says that, uh, 
women are looking for Mr. Perfect and uh, men are looking for Mrs. Good Enough, right? Now, whether, whether, that's, whether that's hypergamy or not, what we see is that women are generally much pickier, right? They generally have higher standards. Mm-hmm. And this is something that we see across- For long-term uh, dating or is that for short-term dating or both? Well, short-term as well, right? So one thing that's quite interesting, and in, in, I'm sure you know this, men lower their standards for short-term mating, whereas mm-hmm. women keep them the same or higher, depending on the trait, right? So if you look at looks, right, just physical attractiveness. But that's men in certain will... categories though, isn't it though? Because I mean, like you'll see women lower their standards on, or sorry, raise their standards on short-term dating when it comes to the looks department, but she'll happily go out and bang a guy that just got out of jail and doesn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of if he's good looking enough though. Like, yeah, so this is the, this is the watching type of that thing behavior. This is the type of thing I'm talking about with the hypergamy thing is mm-hmm. that when a woman dates a hot guy who doesn't have his life together, that's hypergamy. When a woman dates an ugly guy who, you know, has more money than her, right? Mm-hmm. That's hypergamy. It right? is, yeah. When yeah. a woman like all this stuff, it's well, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying it is necessarily. I'm saying that it's like, okay, so every time there's any mismatch at all um it's it's ex post facto becomes hypergamy like you need to you need to i think that if you want to study hypergamy right and i'm and i'm using i'm using the term hypergamy i don't i don't know if it i don't know if it's the best one to use but i understand that it's it's the one used in this context if you want to study this sort of topic you need to define your variable pretty precisely before you go into it so you can ask the question it's like do women so one specific question, which I think you'll get an affirmative answer, it's like, do women prefer to date men who have more money than them, right? Who have better financial prospects than them? If that's your definition of hypergamy, then it's like, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty well supported idea. If you look at looks, right now, it gets more complicated because just from behavioral data, it seems that women are willing to loosen up their standards on looks a lot more than men, um, certainly for long term dating. For short-term dating, men and women are more similar in the sense that we both aim for like the best looking person possible. But the difference is that men are willing to drop their standards in a way that women aren't. So I think that hypergamy is uh, one issue that I have with the red pill is that it's like, look, we can talk about that. We can have a conversation about Mm -hmm. the idea that women are more selective and have a preference to date up um, on social hierarchies, right? Um, we can talk about that and, and discuss the evidence for and against it. But we can't just say hypergamy for every dating situation ever, right? Because it's like, if it's hypergamy when the guy's better looking, but she's making more money, but it's also hypergamy when she's better looking and he's making more money, then it's, it's, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, yeah, like, no, uh, every, I, every I fully agree. And I, yeah, there are absolutely outliers. I mean, I've had conversations with lots of people where it's like, you know, you sort of dive down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, dating and hypergamy and how uh, men and women prioritize uh, mates. And you'll always have that random, uh, you know, gal pop out and she'll be like, but wait, that doesn't apply to me because I'm a lawyer making $300,000 a year and my husband's a stay at home dad and, you know, he doesn't even work. And, uh, you know, like you'll always get those in, any sampling. I'm well, okay. I, so I, I've spoken unclearly. I am not saying, I'm not pointing to exceptions to prove through. That's not how, that's not how I, that's not how I even think about topics. I too think about averages, right? I would never, yeah. if, if there's an average trend, right? Like I've said in this conversation that the average person cares about looks before almost anything else when they're dating. Yeah, I'm not going to point to my buddy. I'm not going to point to my buddy and say, oh, he doesn't care about looks when he's dating. Therefore, it's not true. That's not that's not how averages work on the hypergamy point. I was I was, I was making I was making a very specific point, which is that. If it's hypergamy, right, hypergamy, when a woman dates a guy who's better looking than her, but makes less money, but it's also hypergamy when a woman dates a guy who makes more money, but is worse looking than her right? Then we could flip the situation with the same evidence, right? And say men are hypergamous, right? Which is, which, which sounds the, it's like, oh, you, look at that low life, like, yeah. right, right? Like he's using his looks and trading it for a woman who has more money than him, right? And then we could also do the flip thing and say, oh, look, he's being hypergamous. He's dating a woman who's better looking than him, but makes less money, right? So, so it's the same set of data points. And we're just saying hypergamy, hypergamy, hypergamy. And it's like, we ha- okay, we have to select a variable, right? If you want to talk about this in a serious scientific way, you have to select a specific variable, 
right? And then assess whether that specific point is true. And so it depends what type of hypergamy we're talking about. If we're talking very specifically about money, then I agree. It's like, yes, women generally exhibit a preference for men who are making more money than themselves. Mm. And they have a, a high preference for that. Yeah, I think this is where you see things slightly differently because, I mean, um, you know, to me, you know, exception to rule doesn't disprove the rule. It's just an outlier. And I think, you know, on a balance of probabilities, if the vast majority of women. Uh, OK, so here's a really good example. So, no, but I'm not saying I may. I'm not saying the exception to the rule thing. I, 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 I just clarified that I'm not saying that. No, no. But just hear me out for a second. So as an example, like if I were to state that 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 women are are hypergamous and they tend to marry and date across on a social economic scale. Yeah, I've read research papers. Yes, I've read, you know, some Evo Psych and, you know, followed some useful content. But I've also been a private lender for a number of years, too. And as a private lender, I have to look at credit applications. And on the credit applications, it has their job and it has what their income is. And I've seen in the vast majority of cases when people are applying for uh, financing, private mortgage, you know, whatever it happens to be, uh, Mr. almost always makes a lot more money than Mrs., Right, but so, wait, I, I I don't understand. Do you, do you think I I you're not disagreeing with me? I just but, said that. No, I'm agreeing. But what I'm point. saying is like in the context of hypergamy, and I think you know one of the things that we wanted to talk about in this podcast as well is the disagreements you know with the red pill and the mano swamp, is that um, I think it's more of like a broad statement where it's just you know women are generally hypergamous, right? And this is what I've seen as far as behavior. This is what I've seen as far as. Um, you know, reading papers and stuff like that. But then it gets nuanced, right? Because women's uh, preferences will change uh, depending on what their mate value is, what they look like, how old they are, perhaps even where they are in their ovulatory shift, you know, as Marty Hazleton talks about. So there's a number of variables that you can really dive down a whole bunch of rabbit holes and get super geeky on. And that's not what I do it because to me, that gets boring as shit. I mean, people will podcast on that for five or six hours like, dude, we get it, right? Like, you know, like, let's just get back to the basics here and get on with life. So uh, like, that's how I approach it. But I understand that there are a lot of potential variables and rabbit holes where you could examine it from different perspectives and angles. Well, do you, right? under do you understand my gripe is with, the, is with what you just said, which is that like, oh, hypergamy as a general term, hypergamy as a general phenomenon. And I'm like, okay, well, empirically, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. We need to define the term and then assess its truth based on that sp the specific variable. So you could say, but women I mean, you're more have, of a like, statistician if you were to say, if you were to say very specifically with regards to, uh, with regards to finances, women are generally hypergamous, right? They want to date someone who makes more money right. than themselves. I would say yes. Right. Um, but a lot of the red pill guys, right. They put everything to hypergamy. So when a woman dates a guy who's, you know, like you said, you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the, the kind of anecdotal idea of like a guy who's a hot criminal, right? You labeled that as hypergamy as well. And it's like, eh, is it? It's like now we're talking about a different type of thing. We're talking about, well, she's you know, women's, short -term, short, women's increased yeah. short term preferences for looks, which is exactly. not that doesn't really fit with the hypergamy story. And that's what annoys me about a lot of these, you know, red pill twerps is just talking about like, oh, well, everything's hypergamy, everything's hypergamy, though, everything. No, it's not. A, it's not. I'm not saying that it disproves the hypergamy point that we mm -hmm. just talked about with money. I'm saying that it, that a lot of the red pill guys they label that as hypergamy as well, and that doesn't. Fit. So, so let me uh, present this option to you. Uh, you know, a woman's at a bar. She has ten men to select from. Uh, some of them are successful. Some are not. One guy just got out of jail. He looks like a total chad. He's a ten out of ten. He's a good looking guy. He looks like you. He's got the hunter eyes, right? And oh, stop it. But. But he hasn't got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, and yeah. he's sleeping on his sister's couch. She may prioritize him over the other options that night just because he's the best looking guy as far as options go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so, a, that's absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, so let's just go back to the beef with the whole like, red pill and mano swamp and the dating coaches and the pickup artists and all that stuff. So, what are the, what are the biggest, um, mistakes or maybe the uh awful pieces of advice or pieces that you see out there over and over again that seem to frustrate you because i know there's there's quite a few right that just don't yeah lie. There's, there's quite a, there's quite a few there's quite a few i mean most of my beef actually to be honest mate a lot of my beef isn't with specific pieces of advice per se mm -hmm. it's specific elements of the worldview so okay. hypergamy is an example of that where it's like, okay, you're talking hypergamy, hypergamy, hypergamy. And then the situation that you just described 
in the bar where it's like, okay, so she chose the guy who's lowest status, least amount of money, right? Lower status than her, lower education level than her yeah. because he's good looking. And it's yeah. like, yeah, looks for short-term mating looks really matter. And that's not, I mean, some of these, some of these guys, they'll be like, oh, that's the, that's the other side to hypergamy. And it's like, okay, everything's hypergamy, right? Everything's hypergamy. Congratulations. You can never mm. be wrong because, because you've already <laughs> determined that everything's hypergamy, right? Right. But, I mean, it's just like, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a very simple minded way, way of viewing the world. You have to pick. Yeah. I think that. Um, yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right yeah. about that. There are a lot of guys that take shit and they sort of run with it in the context just to sort of like reaffirm their ego investments in their life, their life choices, in some case failures, right? Um, yeah. You know, they use it to sort of, you know, dismiss, you know, where they are. And I think when I approach, um, you know, the conversations and the videos that I make and the podcasts that I do, it's like, look, guys, like if I was sitting here talking to a room full of men, don't be a loser. Chase excellence. Don't chase women. Be good looking. Don't be fat. Have some style. You know, get a proper haircut. If you're losing your hair, don't hold on a scrap. Shave it off. Like, you know, like the standard sort of things, because it's like you're not going to do all these things for women's attention or to capture them or to, you know, like rack up a notch count. Like one of the things that frustrates the hell out of me when I was in the Mano Swamp is, is these dipshits that just go on and on about their notch count. They'll actually like have a number and they'll know what it is. And it's like, dude, like, you know, yep. do you count the number of dumps that you take as well too? Like what else do you count? Right. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's an obsession with something that seems almost like it's absurd and there's yep. more to life than just racking up notches and chasing tail in my opinion. But at the same time, I want guys to understand, look, women are going to prioritize, uh, you know, if you're out at a bar and you want to hook up for short-term dating, the best looking guy, like it doesn't yep. matter that he took the bus there and has tattoos on his face and his neck. She might be a recent, you know, divorcee who's 39 with three kids and they're at her mom's and she's horny and she wants to get it on. She's going to pick him. It doesn't matter. Right. Like I like I like that you I like that you uh, added face and neck after that to avoid hurting my feelings. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I wasn't I, even I, thinking I, about the tattoos yeah. you have on your arms, but yes. Yeah, OK, yeah. but uh, yeah, you know, to the point of, you know, the bad boy look, but it, it it's to me more. Like I like to simplify things in a realm where it's like, just understand that this is kind of what hypergamy is and why it matters. Don't worry about the science and the data. Let Mackin deal with that. You know, he'll do the research and the lectures and the, you know, the papers and the podcast and all that sort of stuff. But like the reason why I think, you know, the man of swamp sort of, you know, distills it down to alpha C, beta need, or, you know, however else they want to label it is it just simplifies it for guys that just don't understand the basics. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. I, 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 under, I understand what's going on. I think, I think that, so here's my main, here are my main beefs with the red pill and then you can decide where we want to take it. Mm -hmm. Um, first off, a lot of it just seems, it doesn't seem a lot of it is sexist and bitter, right? It's, it's psychologizing women. As an example, like what would be sexist and bitter? Okay. So, so f for example, um, Well, we, I mean, we could, we could, t we could take some of the things that I mentioned at the outside, uh, outside of the conversation. Yeah, like when I go on your Twitter and you see want. things like, like 90, 90% 90 of women have nothing to offer in relationships other than sex. Mm. I'm like, what an, what an, what a, like, I, th you know I think where that came from that actually came from a stand up comedy routine. A lot of my material comes from stand up comedy. Yeah. Sort well, of you know, it down you know, to, my, get, to get your attention I mean, on it because truthfully though, yeah, well, to me, to me, it's is not that, funny. Is and that, it's also, and, is that really and, sexist and, though? Is that really sexist to say that to if, say, if a what? man oh. isn't chasing excellence in his life and doing something of some significance, she probably won't stick around. Because, I mean, at the end of the okay, day, the clock, not, that's, the no, clock no, no, does no. tick down I, to the end of the relationship, right? If if he gets lazy, incompetent, he can't hold a job, he can't provide for the family. I've routinely seen women leave men in, in you know situations like that. So that's what that really boils down to. And at the same time, the sex if she's not having... Part, saying that 90% saying that of women have nothing to offer in relationships other than sex. I, no, if that's, that's not, not what it says. No, that's not what it says. All right, let's pull it up. Pull it up. You can uh, sh you can actually share it on the screen if you want to hit the present button. I think you'll be able to uh, plop nice. it up on the bottom screen there. Um, but I mean, like that is actually from um, Dr. Warren Farrell. Uh, you know, he came to the conclusion in his books and his studies that men are success objects to women and women are sex objects to men. Do you? Yeah, that's not how agree I agree with that, that or disagree I, with that. That's, I disagree with that. That, that's not how I view women. And that's also, you know, that's not how I would want someone viewing my sisters or my colleagues. I mean, that's, yeah. 
but that's I, how I, 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 but that's I, I, how men and women tend to view each other though like like women look at men as success objects generally speaking and men look at women as beauty objects it's why there's no I think man you'd be, ever I, actually, history. You'd be, I think you'd be I think you'd be surprised how much sorry I'm scrolling while talking here I'm yeah but, rude, but but I mean it's why you've never you, heard anybody in history you, as a guy say oh wow look at the degree on her yeah but right? it, I mean it, it goes back to the sorry I'm trying to find this right now okay Remove sex from a relationship, you will discover that 90% of women have nothing to offer men in relationships. Mm -hmm. That's a salacious is statement. It's, it's, it's amplified to get your attention. But if you, yeah, but, if but, you but take away that. Mate? At what cost, mate? Like, think about, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I definitely don't want, I don't want, I don't want to make that, I don't want to make this, you know, I, like a personal beef. Like I, I want to have an, I want to have an actual discussion. Yeah. 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 That's but what surely, I mean, like, like you've got a daughter, mate, like surely yeah. you wouldn't like, like I would, I, I, I would be, absolutely tell my daughter to prioritize her beauty and her purity over getting degrees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't want her we, getting obese, cutting her hair short, dying it purple, fighting the patriarchy, like none of that woke nonsense. Absolutely not. Is that what you yeah. want your daughter doing? I've, that's, that's not what I said at all. Uh, I'm saying, I'm saying that it, when I, when I read through, when I just scroll through your Twitter, right. Mm -hmm. Or look at any, and I, and I don't want to make this, I don't want to make this narrowly about you. But when I go on all, any of these, you know, red pill pages, I see I've a got bunch thick of skin. Like so if that. you want to make it about me, it's totally fine. No, no, no. I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. And I actually do appreciate that. I recognize that, you know, Rolo Tomasi would never have me on his show, right? And the Fresh and Fit, they wouldn't have me on their show, that kind of thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, I recognize that it's like, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely grateful that you're willing to have a discussion with me. But when I go through these red pill guys' feed, right? Mm -hmm. Any of them, it's just, I'm like, wow, you really view women. It really seems like they all view women as just purely objects for their sexual entertainment. As opposed to fully fledged human beings, you know, I don't. With their, I mean, with I've, their got own wants, I've got a girlfriend. I've got a daughter. Own wants, I've got a mother. Own, yeah, their their own their own goals. Right? I've got lots of women they're, in my life. Yeah, I know you do, and that's why I find so how it surprising. Can I possibly hate women or be? I didn't. Oh, I didn't say you hate. I didn't say you hate women. I said or, that. Sorry. Um, things, would you call it uh, sexist? Sexist was what you. Yeah, it. it's like to me, it's like I, if this isn't sexist, I don't know what is, and I don't I want this to devolve into. I don't. I also don't want this to devolve into just name calling, right? That doesn't seem like a productive use of our time. But if you're asking me what my issue with the red pill is, it's mm. like that's one of the core issues. It's like this attitude towards women that seems to view them purely as objects for sex, as opposed to, again, fully fledged human beings. And I know that all, all the comments are gonna be white knight, simp, cuck. I don't care. It's fine. Yeah. It's like surely like and and you said yourself you know you, you got a sister-in-law you got a mother you got a daughter you got a girlfriend right surely they're more to you than that so much more like the, the yeah, human being and and they absolutely are mackin but they would never call me sexist right like the, well i know they, they may not I mean, like the way you're... in which i present certain certain uh information because i mean keep in mind like twitter is microblogging right it, it's it's very short stuff and right and i recognize that twitter twitter often brings out the worst in people and and, and in yeah. truth you know in in reading in reading your book and watching your video and watching your videos there there are some attitudes i disagree with but it does seem that uh it does seem that twitter has managed to yeah, to, okay. to take out the the most the most uh but offensive i'm, but I'm trying there. to understand how you know stating that men are success objects to women and women are beauty objects to men is a sexist statement i don't think i i think that you would agree you that men and women are object, different you yeah? said sex objects but sex yeah, objects but beauty fine. objects yeah. yeah but i mean like i think that you would agree that men and women are different in many ways than they are in probably just as many ways as they are similar if not more yeah yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that there are that there are psychological sex differences. So yeah, why would it be you know, sexist to view the behavior of men's mate choices as men looking at women as beauty objects? Because I think we're doing a disservice when we tell women to go and climb the corporate ladder and chase excellence. Because here's here's what I see that 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 is that is a complete disservice to to women. 
And I'm starting to talk to more and more women. I've already had conversations with hundreds of them, but I want to move this into the thousands so that it so that it starts to corroborate a little bit more. But I'm starting. I think to see if you women... want to if you want to move it if you want to move it into the thousands, you're going to have to focus a little less on being salacious on Twitter and more on you know. Well, well, we'll see how that goes. I have a new podcast I'm doing Monday nights called uh, Ladies Night. So okay. um, make sure Best you guys follow fun. the Unplugged Alpha podcast. But <laughs> what I'm starting to see is is a lot of women that are that are basically like I'm 37, 38, 39, 40. Um, I feel like I've missed the boat. I've I've done what I was told. You know, I got the degrees. I climbed the corporate ladder. I bought the house. I have the Mercedes C class. I framed my degrees in mahogany and put them on the wall and presented them to everybody. I have my little white dog. I have 17 pillows on my bed and a beautifully decorated and organized house. But where is my man? Where, like, why can't I find this guy? Yeah, and yeah, that's that, a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I look, we, we have been lied yeah. to and they've been told to basically go and become men because everything that they've done to get to this point where they now don't have families and they feel like they're missing the boat and they're unable to uh, basically meet that strong burning biological need to reproduce. You know, the biological clock is, you know, the the eggs are starting to dry up, you know, if you will. Um, they feel like they've been let down. And I'm starting to see a lot of women that have complaints about that. And it's like, you know, I kind of wish I didn't do this now. I kind of wish that I prioritize finding a good guy and suddenly now and early and having that family rather than do all this stuff because it's not fulfilling. Yeah, I mean that's that's that? a very that that's that's a very different because that's now taking science and setting that aside. That's like now dealing with a human being, right? Yeah, yeah, I I understand where I understand where you're getting at. I guess I guess we'll just put a pin in my issues with you know some some the the bitterness and vibe, and we can talk about. I mean, I, I view this as a separate conversation. I, th mm -hmm. I think that you're you're viewing it as an integrated one, mm -hmm. whereas it's like we can talk about you know, women's mating strategies, what's effective, what's not. Right. And, and it is a real problem. This idea of like, oh, you focus on your career, focus on your career, focus on your career. And it's like, oh, you know, now I'm 38 and all my friends are married and I focused on my career too long. And now I want to have a family, but now I've got to find a guy. How long does that take? I've got to vet the guy. How long right. does that take? Yeah. Right. I've got to actually go through the process of reproducing, which doesn't happen overnight. It's like, yeah, that's a very tough situation because, you know, the process of starting from zero to finding a man, meeting a man, you know, mutually selecting each other and getting pregnant, all of that, that can take, uh, that's, that's typically like a five year process. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. It's like, yes, some people are going to focus on their career towards too late for too, for too long. There are some men in that situation, but you know, for mechanical reasons, it's just less likely for a man to find himself in that situation. Uh, most men are, you know, still there, there, there is, you know, a decline in genetic quality. There are reasons to have kids younger as a man, um, but yeah. it, there, it doesn't, but fertility doesn't hard stop the way it does with women. So I appreciate exactly, that there's yeah. a difference there. Yeah. And then I there's also the issue with, there. I think with... it's a real issue, but I, but I will just okay. say is that like, for me, this is a separate conversation topic, mate. Like okay. we can, we can talk about that, but we're talking about it very separately from saying things like, oh, women are sex objects, right? Well, we can perhaps do a part making, two. You know, we... ma making, making fun of Taylor Swift's body on Twitter. It's like, I used to teach seventh graders and it's like, if they were saying this type of joke, I'd be like, this is guys, guys, like, like we gotta, we gotta, uh, well, be a fortunately little I'm not your student and I'm old enough to crack jokes. Right. Which I, yeah, well, yeah, you're, you're I mean, it does say in my that. Twitter bio that there's going to be a little bit of comedy here in this feed. So yeah. I mean, and you, you know what? And, that, and that's the other, that's the other thing is that it could be, fact. it could be, it could be just, it could be just a difference in sense of humor. Um, mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, you know, there's going to be a spectrum as to what's, what's appreciated. I suppose that, I suppose that on the other side of things, it's like, because it's mixed in with, you know, very, you know, very serious statements. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, it's just hard for me to see, but, uh, but, you know, I also don't want to, I'm not a fan of taking people out of context. I'm not a fan of, you know, reading the worst possible version um, into whatever you're saying. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you say, if you say that you meant when you said, you know, 90% of women have nothing to offer, but sex and relationships. If you are saying that that's just a provocative version of saying that men really value physical attractiveness, then that, then that's that, you know, no men really that, value sex in a relationship. 
Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Like that, but but I, I, think, I assumed because you said I think the that if you were to ask men, kind of, you know, that are getting married, one of the reasons why they select marriage is because they think they're going to have uh, access to wild, crazy sex into perpetuity, and you know that's like one of the conversations <laughs> that I often have a lot of the times is that you know like you have to understand like when you get into a long term relationship and there's comfort and you live together and you get married and you invite the state in your house like sex is like one of the things that usually goes away or diminishes like there's very few people that are like oh yeah, yeah sex I definitely, bang way that's a more conversation we can have as well yeah yeah that's um, a conversation we can have as well about sex I want to go back to the I do not think the... I do not think though I but just to jump in I do not okay. think that most men are getting married for wild and crazy sex I think that's a lot easier that's a okay. lot easier to get outside okay so let's come back to that in a minute but I mean I also want to talk yeah. about the um you know because we're talking about how women are beauty objects and men are success objects so in you know, the statement of that fact, I encourage men to chase excellence because men want women around, right? And if you want to keep a woman around and in your frame and in your life and as a compliment to your life, you can't be a dipshit, right? Like I, I've, I've lost count of the conversations that I've had with women, uh, you know, when I was dating after I got divorced where that, and I talked about this in my book, so I know that you've uh, seen it where it's like, you know, like, why did you guys break up and why did you get divorced? And there was a lot of, well, he was a beta, he was incompetent, he couldn't hold down a job, he couldn't provide for the family. And women routinely leave men in long-term relationships and marriages if they see the guy as incompetent and, and not a winner. They want to look up to a giant, okay? Um, and I think you know that. And that's why I'm telling guys, chase excellence, right? Like, men are success objects to women. I don't think Dr. Warren Farrell is inaccurate or wrong there you may disagree with the with the assessment but i still believe and you know like if you've got some evidence that disproves it that men and women look at each other in this general sense broadly speaking there are exceptions you know there are yeah i think it's okay so well, well let's let's get into the nuance of it so i think that i think that we've spent enough time and you know one, one of my goals for this show is not to devolve into like I'm, just, I'm, it's just not my personality to be, you know, on a show. Uh, like you can tell that I'm, that I'm, that I'm uncomfortable with, with, you know, having to say that, you know, I, I actually find this to be harmful as, a, as a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not really in my natural, um, natural repertoire to so, just be covering this sort of thing. Actually, so I, I would sure. like to let's just talk about the facts for a second. Yeah. yeah okay, um, in terms of the, in terms of the factual side of that, so we can talk about the the phrasing, how I find it uncomfortable. We can talk about the phrasing, how it's like, I think that it's harmful to women. Like I wouldn't want like my little, my little sister reading a tweet like that. It's just like, what? Like, uh, this is not how women should be told. Your to think little themselves. sister should not be following me on, on Twitter. I'm not for little sisters. <laughs> I, I, well, I, th I think she can handle it. It's more just, it's more just in terms of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to be the mentality that she takes on for herself. Um, but let's talk about, let's talk about the underlying. So you're, you're saying that it gets at an underlying truth which is that men, women care about men's success, right? And men care about women's bodies, right? And I'd say that there, there, there's definitely some truth to that in the sense that when we, look at, when we look at both behavioral and survey data, but especially survey data, we see these big sex differences where it's like women care a lot more about ambition, uh, which is a proxy for resources, about right. education, which is a proxy for resources, about resources themselves, right? So that's, that's success. And then we also see on the other side of that, that men, when you ask them, they care significantly more than women about physical attractiveness, right? And youth, which is a pro relative youth, it depends. Younger so you're men basically don't, saying don't what care. I said in the tweet in a much more pleasant way. <laughs> I'm well. Well, <laughs> let me wait, wait. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on. A All right, keep I'm going. Getting, keep going. I'm getting there. Um, yeah, I, I guess. I guess. I'm, I guess. I'm slightly more pleasant. But yeah. The um, but. There's also let's but talk that about that won't get retweeted data. five thousand times. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, it'll it'll do well on TikTok. Um, Maybe <laughs> if um, yeah, that that that's a funny idea of us us saying the same thing and my following being almost entirely women and uh, your following being almost entirely men. But do you ever get criticized case, by your audience for being a misogynist or hating women or a sexist or anything like that? Like, have you ever heard that? Because I mean, there are some no. statements that you've made that I've also said, but I mean, you just say it differently. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that I think that that the the delivery matters because it often reflects yeah. an underlying. It reflects the underlying attitude. Like I'm, I, I do tend you think to it's a matter of time that. before you get hit with something like that because I, I don't think that a guy like Jordan Peterson 
anticipated uh you know being called names like that and well jordan jordan peterson's following was like 95 percent male um yeah. my following is like 95 percent female so yeah. And any case, and I know, I know, I'm gonna get the again. I'm gonna get more. I, 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 I can't, I can't see comments right now, but I'm sure it's you know, blue pill. I just cut, ignore them. You know, just ignore that kind yeah. of thing. It's well, fair. it's one Whatever. of the things. It's like, it's like cry harder. Yeah. Like it's just every single time I say something like this, I, I get all those comments. But in any case, let you so you let let's wind back to the point, right? Mm -hmm. Those sex differences are based on survey data. And mm -hmm. earlier in this conversation, we both came to agreement. It's like, hey, survey data, not quite enough. Mm -hmm. When you look at behavioral data, it's actually very surprising how much more women care about looks than they say and how much less they care about money and status and resources in practice. I'm not saying that they don't care about it more than men. They absolutely do. But they care about it proportionately less. Than, this is kind of a statistically hard thing to explain. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I'm I, I'm I'm a hundred. Where are you getting this data from? Is this from surveys? I it, no 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 no. It's 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 actually a I, I believe it's a 2015. I'll be able to send you the study afterwards. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm not I'm not making this up. Um, it's. But I mean, I if you're it, but if you're getting this data, then I'm assuming that you're asking women what they're choosing men based on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm getting to that. They're stating so it, it's that it's actually, not based on. No, no, no. So, I, so I'm getting to that. So or that to the degree that we data. would expect that it would be. That would be survey data. That would be survey mm -hmm. data, right? And for the survey data, we do see these large sex differences. Okay. But let's look at the behavioral data because earlier you mentioned it's like, hey, what, what people say and what they do, they're mm -hmm. two different things. And when you look at the behavioral data, for example, like speed dating studies, these are great, very interesting. Basically, you get tons of people in a room, you have them do speed dating and you see real life mate selection. It's like who actually wants to see each other again? Mm. Yeah, it's all based and on looks practice, for the most part. What do we see? We see that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that looks come up at a way higher level for women than they said, mm -hmm. right? And status and resources, they do make a difference, right? Like like having a higher educational yeah, level, we're in having a higher because, salary, these things. But I think that we're in agreement because at the end of the day, well, that, well, that, looks well, are most well, important the, for something the way it disagrees like... Is that you know, dating apps, swiping, like the vast majority of swipes are not based on his bio, how much he makes, even, what his job is. Yeah, yeah, but, his, spe but speed you know, dating. It's the first photo sort of thing. But it's just like, okay, so now we've yes. made the connection. Maybe I'm at a, a time in my life, you know, if I'm a gal where I want to settle down and have a family. So I need a guy that can, that, that, that has adequate genes at a bare minimum, you know, but there are women that like, one of the things that I find interesting, so women will cuck men, right? So let's talk about that, right? So so if a woman goes and well, sleeps we, with another can we, guy, can we quickly, I actually do want to. So I've I've run okay. studies on infidelity, and I can talk about I can talk about inf the infidelity studies Great. in depth. That's that's something that that's Great. what I wrote my master's dissertation at Oxford on. So we 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 can really get into that. But cool. I do want to just drill down on this point with the women. Men are success objects. Women mm -hmm. are beauty objects. Okay, right? that sex difference. It's like there's some support for that in the stated preference data. There's less support for, and you said that, you know, you prefer behavioral data over survey data. So I'm telling you what the behavioral data is. Mm -hmm. This is dating apps, right? This is speed dating studies. This is interpartner correlations. So actual relationships, what, what level they're at, that kind of thing. And what do we see? We see that men do put a higher priority on looks than women, right? And women do put a higher priority on things like education, status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But men care more about education, status, et cetera, than they say. And women care more about looks. Looks than they say. Than they say. Yeah. And so what does that actually look like? But that would make the well, tweet so much but it, more boring, Mac. And if I had to put a footnote, like in certain situations, <laughs> and da, 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 you know, reference no, to the my study point, in 2015. My point is, that my point, my point is more that, um, is, is that in practice, it's like men are beauty objects too. Right, yeah, whether absolutely. women say it or not, men I have, are I have no disagreement with that. There's an entire yeah. community of black pill guys out there that totally believe that too, right? Yeah, like well, the, that's the thing. That's the thing. Guys, that, right? the, the 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 two misinterpretations of me are that I'm just a devout um, blue pill, or that I'm I'm I'm. No, I don't think I'm so. A, I think that a, I think that you're a scientist that 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 is is so narrow in thinking with data that it's like you're like a horse with blinders that see scientific data and that's and that's what you rely on but yeah. there's certain it's areas my hunter eyes I, 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 it's my hunter eyes they take away my peripherals see that's the problem man you know you get the good looks with the hunter eyes but you don't get the peripherals yeah. um yeah, exactly. okay so let's talk about the um cucking thing right so yeah. if 
because I mean, like we were talking about the prioritization of um, mates and looks and resources and all that sort of thing. So, you know, there's this dual mating strategy. I don't know if you agree or disagree with it. I know there's been some kind of flip flopping in the Evo psych, you know, community like it exists, yeah. maybe it doesn't exist. We're not sure about it. We need to study it more like because it because based on behavior and we can't get accurate data on this, which I find so fascinating. Like I tried to find at least some sort of relevant, specific, tailored data to it. But it relies on women making women look bad, admitting that they've cucked the uh, guy who who thinks that they're the father. And I talked about this. Oh, there is some. No, there is some it. good data on this. There is some good data on this. Because I, I couldn't find anything. Like it was anywhere yeah. from like anywhere from ten to thirty percent, depending on where you got the information from, based on behavior, not yeah. on survey. But yeah, I've if gone, women will yeah. go and get pregnant by the hot dude, and then tell you know the average guy it's your kid, and then he has to raise it, like. How do you, you know, how do you contend with that? Because that's something that the Mano Swamp seems to get right. Yeah, so that's so that's interesting. That this this is this is you're really, we've we've finally gotten to into my we've done this. Like, so, let's let's do it, man. Yeah, yeah. So, look, the female infidelity debate has been a very complicated, mm. contentious one. It's 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 quite a confused one at some points. We mentioned the ovulation shift thing earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, oh, it seems like they're shifting preferences for looks and masculinity at ovulation. And then newer it? data, it's like, mm, not, not so much, right? Okay. Then you look at, and then, so this caused a bunch of scientists to come out with this new idea. They're like, well, what if it's mostly mate switching, right? Maybe some mm -hmm. women are doing this, but what if it's mostly mate switching? And basically, so mate switching, it sounds like it is what it sounds like. It's this idea that when women have affairs, they're looking for a new boyfriend or a new husband, Right. I saw that and I was like, well, maybe, but, but when you, but as you say, like, it's like the, uh, I, I don't completely discount personal experience. It's like, are, is that really right? That when most women have affairs, they're looking for a new boyfriend. Like that doesn't seem. It seems like they want right. out. Like when women have affairs, it's not generally for a variety, like men do it for. It's more for, because they want an exit strategy. They're kind of done with the guy at that point. Isn't yeah. So that, that was that, 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 that was true? the that was the mate switching hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, so I might be slightly biased because, because so now you can call it the dual mating hypothesis. We'll keep it with that, but I want to make, I want to put a real, we'll keep calling it the dual mating strategy hypothesis. Cause that's what most red pill guys call it. Mm -hmm. But I want to put a really big flag down that you can talk about that independently of ovulation shifts. Right? So just logically, it's possible that women have no preference shifts at ovulation at all, mm -hmm. but they're still op they're still having a dual mating strategy because they prioritize different things in short term mates versus long term mates, different things in affair partners, right, versus long term partners. Correct. And you so can't always find, find it in the same guy, so that's why there seems to be a little bit of flip flopping with that. Yeah. Yes, and that's why there's also some confusion. Is that the vast majority of women? at least at any one given time. I'm not saying across the entire life course, but the vast majority of women at any one given time are enacting a you know, single mating strategy, let's call it. I mean, that doesn't sound as good as dual mating strategy, but it's like mm -hmm. they're getting genes and investment from one partner, right? The dual mating strategy basically posits that if women are looking for genes and investment. And it's based off of, it's based off of other animals where we know this is happening, right? Like we're, we're very confident that some species of birds are enacting a dual mating strategy. Right. Why are we confident in that? Well, we, we look at the paternity rates and we see that, oh, you know, a lot of the eggs don't belong to the male who's raising the eggs, right? Um, and then who did she mate with in terms of reprodu reproduction? she mated with a better looking male, right? A male, a better looking according, according to birds, probably because the male's more robust, right? He has better plumage, that kind of thing. Measurable, mm -hmm. measurable traits that seem to be attractive. And there's, so this, there's this theoretical idea that maybe women are doing the same thing sometimes, right? Maybe some women who cheat um, are, and are, are driven by the same underlying evolved psychology. So let's, let's talk about the evidence for that. The ovulation shift idea, mm, doesn't seem to have borne out, right? I, I'm I'm half and half on it. Maybe we'll see what the next ten years of research show. But in terms of, in How terms of, what have been researching this stuff for? 
So I've been, I mean, this has been what I've, what I've done since undergrad and I've done a master's. No, I mean, like, like, like as humans, like how long have we been researching evolutionary, you know, psychology and human behavior? Like this has been going on oh, for since, a long, since long about time. The 80s. Why since do we need another 10 years to study this? Like, why can't we oh, sort yeah, of settle yeah. so on it's, what it's we have more, here? It's more that it, well, usually science is quite stable and building, right? Mm. So, so I, 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 I really don't want to lose the kind of train of thought with the um, okay. infidelity stuff. So, but, but just to jump in on that one point and then we'll circle back to it. So everyone kind of put pause on uh, explaining the evidence for female infidelity. So sometimes science, it's just home run after home run after home run building on a case, right? So one example of that is the idea that men care more about looks than women, right? Or men care more about relative youth than women, right? Like, yes, when women start to get older, they do start to find younger men attractive, but it's not the same. It's not, the, it's not to the same degree near, not even, not even close, right? And it's like the first studies that showed that were in the early 1900s, right? And then the ones that were cross-cultural were in the 80s, right? And then it's just been year after year, home run after home run after home run. That's true, right? No matter how you measure it, whether you measure it with behavior, whether you measure it with surveys, whether you measure it with dating apps, all these new methods come out and then the new methods show the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes science works like that, where it's just building, building, building. But sometimes... It's a little more complicated, right? So in the 90s, we came out with this, um, I'm saying we, scientists in general came out with this, uh, specifically Genghis Dead, came out with this idea where it's like, okay, well, if women prioritize genes more in short-term mating, right, cues to genetic quality in short-term mm -hmm. mating, and they prioritize cues to paternal investment more in, in long-term mating, mm -hmm. um, and that bears as well, then we should expect a shift at ovulation because you can only get pregnant for, you know, few days a month, but you can get investment for the whole month, right? So we should see a shift, right? right? They did, right? Those early studies, and then this is the reason you need to build on them. Those early studies, which were confirmatory, they validated the hypothesis. They had small sample sizes, right? And they had primitive methods, right? So they were using, they were, they were just having women count from menstruation, mm -hmm. not using like a hormonal test or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So you can see why it's like, okay, we need more research on this because it's like those, those initial studies weren't quite perfect. So you need to do them better again. And so the initial studies were supportive. And then the follow-up studies were kind of mixed. The ones with better methods, it's like sometimes we find an effect, sometimes we don't, a little controversial. And now the next, so whether there's an effect or not, what the current state of the evidence seems to be that if there is an effect across the population, it's a small effect. The next generation of studies, what we're going to see over the next 10 years with the ovulation shift stuff, and we're already starting to see this, Rich, is that we're going to look at whether the shift occurs for individual women. Oh, you're frozen up, my friend. You, you still there? Mac, can you hear me? Still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're freezing up. Um, kill your video feed for a little bit, um, just so we can get some clean audio, and then maybe just turn it back on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, man. You froze up for about five Sorry. or ten seconds there. Oh, bummer. Bummer. Sorry to everyone on the live stream. Um, so what was I saying, though? Oh, oh, yeah. Just back up about ten seconds. One real common idea is the idea that women who are paired with unattractive. Okay. So women who are, you know what, Mac and, Mac and just stop for a second. Yeah. yeah. Just turn off your video feed just so we have audio only let that clean up and then we can turn the video on maybe in like 10 or 15 seconds. How do I turn off my video? Uh, just on the bottom of your screen, you'll have oh, stop, stop cam. cam. Yeah. There you go. Okay, cool. Boom. Yeah. So what are we so saying? So can you hear me buffering. now? Yeah, you're good. So yeah. just back up about 10 seconds. Yeah. So, <sighs> So the methods, the later methods that were used that were better, didn't manage to find the, quite the same effects, right? Did, did, okay. Was that well understood? Yeah. And now the next, the reason that I said, hey, we'll see what happens in the next 10 years is that the current studies on this topic are looking at, the, are looking at this phenomenon in a more nuanced way. So it's possible, for example, that maybe women experience shifts in preferences at ovulation if their primary partner has cues to genetic quality that aren't sufficient, right? So maybe he's physically unattractive, right? 
And so that primes them to have a shift. That's possible. So that's what that's what we're what the next studies would be. That that's how science sometimes works. We get better methods, we get more nuanced theories, and then we have to keep testing them. Sometimes though, I think, you know, like yeah. I think that you're gonna find that this is that this is gonna be very, very difficult to pinpoint to an exact science because women's behavior changes based on their age, based on where they are in the ovulation cycle, based on what their options are, like what their own sexual marketplace value, you know, would happen to be. Like I think a a four has different options or might behave differently than a nine or a 10, you know, for example. Um, I mean, I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with in this space because I think it's compelling and very interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you know, since you've studied infidelity, um, what what are your thoughts on humans as a species? Like, are they monogamous? Are we monogamish? Are we non-monogamous? Like, what do you think our mating strategy should be based on your scientific research? Yeah. So I guess, I guess just to wrap up on the, um, on the cuckoldry thing, and, and then I, I definitely okay. will answer that question. Um, but because, because I was, I was, I was in the middle of explaining it before I just had to jump into explaining why science progresses the way it does on the cuckoldry thing. Rates really vary, but we see, I think, but in the West, when you do a random sample, if you do a self, if you do a, a self-selected sample where it's men mm -hmm. who suspect that their baby isn't theirs, then yeah, you get the rates you're talking about, like 30%, right? Yeah. But when you do a random sample, which is the only valid way to do it, right? You, mm -hmm. the, the only, the only valid way to test um, the rates of extra pair paternity is to do a random sample. And usually those rates are 2%. Sometimes they're 1%, right? So about one in 50 babies. That's low. That well, is it low though? I mean, imagine a room full of 50 people and it's like, oh, one of you has a dad that's not your dad. And this is with contraception. This is in mm. the context of condoms, birth control, IUDs, right? Now let's talk, but that doesn't necessarily, so that doesn't necessarily reflect human nature. When you look at natural fertility populations, when you do random sampling of natural fertility populations, and again, this, this is, this is going to be more accurate to our ancestry. You see higher rates. So there was a there was a rural American community that didn't have a lot of contraception. Among them, it was about ten percent, right? Um, uh, oh, your audio froze up again. I like. Oh, I'm not sure what's happening, mate. I'm sorry. Do you want to uh, maybe leave and come back in and see if that fixes it? Just uh, here, I'll. I mean, if you just leave the studio and then click the join link again, see if that fixes it. Sometimes it it hangs up or something's up. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I, is it the same link? Yeah, it's the exact same link. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Yeah. So just leave and then come back in and then just start with your um, audio only. Sorry about this, guys. You know, sometimes when you do these live podcasts, it's it just such as life. Maybe the uh, internet connection to Australia isn't what we need it to be tonight. Um, but I think you make some, you know, compelling points. And, you know, while he's a scientist and everything that he's delivering is based on scientific research and his studies and all that sort of stuff. You know, I think that it's important to have these conversations because if you miss out on this, uh, you know, discussion, then you live in an echo chamber, which is what you'll notice the Mano Swamp, generally speaking as welcome back, man. Hey, thank you. Sorry about that. It looks like, it looks like we're, we're rolling again. So it looks like we're happy. good. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah. So talk so about, yeah. yeah, on cuckoldry, I'll just jump in because this this is a, really a, one of my areas of interest. And we just finished a study on infidelity, on women's infidelity specifically. And mm -hmm. for what it's worth, what did we find? Uh, I mean, I'll I'll send I'll send you the manuscript when it when it comes out. Um, sure. But yeah, on average, when women have affairs, they have affairs with better looking guys, guys who are better looking than their primary partner. And this was so this was. A, I mean, I think that. I wouldn't use those terms, but in terms of the basic concept mm. that hot guys are the affair partners, and then they, they also found that, so basically the gist of it was on average, yeah, my affair partner is better looking. The guy I'm with would make a better dad. Right. Right. So that's- So they get you know, the best right, of both it, worlds. Yeah. And that's for women who cheat. Now, again, most women, most women in the specific, I'm not saying most women across the course of their lifetime, but most women at any given moment, right, 
right, it's going to be one guy at a time. They're going to be getting, you know, the genes and investment from one partner. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it does fit. It does kind of fit the pattern of songbirds where it's or some some songbirds where it's like, yeah, the more robust, better looking male is the affair partner and the better parent is the primary partner. However, mm -hmm. if you look at the data in a more granular level, you see that women cheat for many, many reasons. Like these super simple oh, yeah. rules, it's like some women are mate switching. Like there were women in our sample who, when we asked them, it's like, hey, why did you cheat? They were like, oh, because I was in love with my affair partner, mm -hmm. right? Like I, uh, like I loved him and we ended up getting married later. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not really, that doesn't really fit with the, the what, what do you guys call it? Like the, the AFBB paradigm. It's like, yeah. that doesn't really fit with that. That's, that's a, that's a little, that's more like mate switching, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it but is again, that's what, of... that's a survey response. Um, you'd have to ask more questions hooked up to a lie detector to get the exact data that you'd need. Right. So, I mean, so what we did, it so would look like as an outlier in that sense. If you're interested in a the method, I, there, there are a few ways that you can get around it. Right. Um, now this, this isn't perfect. There are some there are some studies that are that are completely non behavioral where it's like you measure men's shoulder ratios yeah. and things like that and other traits that um and it's like hey have you ever have you ever slept with a woman who's had a boyfriend or whatever and it's like yeah guys who are hotter who have traits that are considered hotter uh, generally do that more um, that's not perfect evidence but it but it gets more of the thing uh, it gets more of the behavioral stuff that you're looking for if you want to get some of... really interesting behavioral stuff interview a male stripper i've had i've had two on my podcast and the stories that they tell are unreal about women's behavior at their little parties yeah i mean i i um i don't know any male strippers but maybe maybe you can maybe you can introduce me yeah, well the i mean the podcast is there so i mean i you know you have to dig them up but yeah so um as far as like the, the general sexual strategy of human beings, like it, it's all over the place, right? It, you know, again, you know, we were talking about this before. It all it all depends on who you are, what your sexual market value is, what your age is, you know, the socioeconomic region. There's a lot of things that like mo cultural beliefs, religious beliefs. Um, what do you think about the notion that um, men compete, women choose? Like, there's a it's not bite quite for right. You. It's not quite right. And I, and I, and I know, you know, it's not quite right. Okay, um, so tell us why. So, and we can talk about the kind of, are humans monogamous? Are they not that kind of thing? Well, let's, let's put a pin in that. Cause that's interesting as well. Right. And you've yeah. actually, you've been almost a hundred percent correct on that in your book. There were, there were, there were some inaccuracies, uh, inaccuracies there, mm -hmm. but I saw a video of yours more recently where you summarized the human mating strategies. And it's basically exactly what I would say. It's okay. like, yes, we have, you know, strong monogamous tendencies, but it tends to be serial monogamy, not lifetime monogamy. We're not really mm. that type of species. That's and an update in that chapter that's actually coming out. I was telling you yeah. about the revisions. Yeah. Yeah. The sex at dawn stuff is a little out of date. Mm. Um, and it's also, it was controversial at the time it came out, but you know, the, it, it tends to be serial monogamy, uh, with affairs that seem to be about that seem to be primarily driven by physical attractiveness or genetic benefits. So mm -hmm. there's this stereotype of like men cheat physically, women cheat emotionally. And it's like, mm, well, kind of, I mean, women are more likely to cheat emotionally, Yeah. but men, but women also cheat physically at a very high rate. Um, so anyway, so what's so a very you, high you rate? Saying, uh, I would say that I, so I've, I've read probably every incident study on infidelity. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I have a good gist, um, and it, the, the rates do vary, but, if you're asking me for my gist, having read everything, sure, yeah, I would say that a low estimate for what percent of it depends if we're talking married, dating, lifetime incidents this year. But most people, when they ask that, it's like, how many wives will cheat on their married marriage partner at some point? Yeah. Right. I would say that a low estimate would be one in twenty, and a high estimate would be one in two. Right. Those are, that's the type of range that we're looking at. And mm. I would say, I would say that most studies, one in 10 is about right. Right. That that's especially for Western samples about one in 10 women, I would say at some point in their marriage will have an affair for but men. That would, but that would require that, that she's honest in basically admitting that she's a slut. 
Well, th- th- on the other end of that, on the other end of that, I mean, I, I wouldn't use that word, but on the other end of that, as you know, but yeah, I know it's not the word that, that you would l- use, but yeah. that's, but that's the thinking that she would go through in the yeah. admission that, you know, I cheated on my husband. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why we have to do, that's why we have to do more than just survey. So that's the thing is that you, you seem to come into this thinking that I'm just Mr. Survey data, survey data, but I said from the start, I, no, I, I know I'm, that you're I'm a scientist. Not, yeah. Yeah. Like I don't like, it's not just, I mean, survey data, it can contribute to science, but, it, but we have to look at the other thing. So yeah. what we, what do we see? Well, we see that this is based on not just women's self-reporting infidelity, but also men. How often have you been cheated on? Right. Have you been cheated on? Have you ever been cheated on that sort of thing? And we see similar rates. It's like, uh, you know, I don't think men always know the truth. You know, they have a lot no, of men. Don't, you're right. You're right. You're right. These are going to be women are, are a lot be... better at hiding it than what men are, to be honest with you. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, maybe, maybe they are better at hiding it. It's hard to know, but I would say that, uh, and you know, I have spoken to some scientists who would, who would agree with you, who would say, look, women are women. Uh, they're better at hiding. I mean, they have more it. to There's lose, more don't they? Stigma. Cause I mean, they have, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. There's more, more to lose. lose. There's more yeah. social stigma. So they're more likely to lie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that there's a legitimate case to be made. Um, you know, I was just speaking to one of my colleagues about this and that, and that's that they said the same thing, mm-hmm. but even if we take that, then we're going to be bumping up the numbers to probably the high estimate. Um, for men, for men, the numbers are always higher. Uh, there's, there's like one exception, but if you read all the studies, it's like women, how often have you been cheated on men? How often have you cheated? It seems that men cheat more than women, but Mm -hmm. the, but I would say that the sex difference isn't as large. And that makes sense from, from an evolutionary biology perspective as well. It's like men have more to gain from affairs and less to lose. Um, yeah. but we were, we were going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about, what um, what the hell were we were on. We were going to, uh, men compete, women choose. Oh yeah. 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 So that, that, that mate choice model is definitely, it applies to most, most mammals. And we certainly have, we certainly have vestiges of that. Right. Like that's, that's definitely, that's definitely a part of the story, but Isn't I the know biggest part of the you, story though, or no. Well, I think that, I think that, you know, I mean, so you said that you've got a girlfriend, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, didn't she have to compete? Didn't you choose? Right. It's not, it's not quite men compete, women choose. That's, that's, that's definitely part of the story, but it's like men, especially men who bring something to the table. Well, I would have to compete against other men out there that she had options in dating at the time that she, but she wasn't competing with any other woman. Of course she was. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what, so, so a better model, the reason I brought up the, the anecdote there, um, again, not trying to just needlessly make things personal mm-hmm. is just no, but illustrate- what I'm saying though, is that, is that, is that men must compete on the sexual marketplace. Like we, we like, it's incumbent on us to make something oh, out yeah. of ourselves. Yes. Right? So oh yes. Oh, that competition just, just amongst compete. other men, yeah, yeah, whereas, yeah. you know, I think that men generally speaking will prioritize my buddy Carl said this a while ago. He said that men prioritize availability. So women that respond, you know, become available to him, you know, sort of thing. Whereas, mm. you know, women are basically choosing from men that, that are competing for their attention. And I think it's generally true. Although, yes, you know, women do compete for men. But I think generally speaking, it's it's men that are out there doing something. They're competing. That's why we go out and we buy nice cars, you know, because we're because we're competing. Like me and my brother all the time is like, oh, my house is bigger than yours. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, what color is your McLaren, bro? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is interesting. We can get into it. Uh, and and I'm, I'm I'm happy to. I, I also recognize that. I, I mean, I'm good to go for time. I can keep talking. Um, yeah, I can go for another uh, 30, 40 minutes if you want to do a full okay. two hours. I mean, this yeah, is yeah. a really interesting conversation. I think the guys yeah, like I, this, I, so. I, yeah, no, no, no. I'm 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 happy to. I mean, all of, this is this is all I think about um, all day, and it's, it's <laughs> you should do more my, with your time, man. You're thinking about this too much. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> my full my full. If you would be horrified if you saw uh, my day to day life. I'm not I'm not out here driving. McLaren's I'm uh I'm sitting down and reading all day um but in any case it's a very boring life but for most people but I enjoy it okay so men compete women choose yeah that statement uh, men compete true women choose true but we can't stop there right because women compete men choose as well This is going to be less true. This is going to be less true. Mm -hmm. This is going to be less true for low mate value males, right? So obviously if you're a male and you have, and you're not, and you're not 
towards the top of the competition, there's not going to be a lot of women competing over you. You're basically mm -hmm. going to be competing to get women's attention constantly. So this isn't going to represent your experience. But, you know, if you're a man who's towards the top of the competitive space, um, it just let's just say a high mate value man, and you're interested in monogamy, which, look, I mean, <laughs> most men are, frankly. I mean, there's this stereotype like, oh, you know, um, what is it? Hogamous, hygamous, men are polygynous, hygamous, hogamous, women are monogamous. It's like, uh, kind of, but not quite. It's like men have more multiple mating impulses probably but not but that's that's not quite right most men are going even yourself right you're 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 mr plate spinner and here you are with a girlfriend it's like Was, men have yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly it's like men have a strong desire towards monogamy uh whether they whether they admit it or not we see it come out in the behavior and but so if you're a, a man, sexual strategy that men have adapted from women right you know watching women you know uh choosing for multiple men because i mean you know I think guys get criticized for dating multiple women simultaneously in a non-monogamous fashion, AKA plate spinning. But I think that women do it by nature. Like you have to tell men to do it, right? Like the average guy out there, and I've had a lot of these dudes calling in my show. It's like, the, you know, the average guy is just a dork and the first girl that touches his pee pee, he, you know, he wants to be the boyfriend, girlfriend, and that's it. And he's not considering other options. He's not looking at red flags. He's not looking at anything and you know he's just looking to sort of lo like lock it down and be like you know can we be a couple sort of thing whereas i think women are looking at options you know they're like until looking a, at options yes but i wouldn't say until I wouldn't a, say, I think, a high value guy you know comes along where other men become an invisible to her and she says yeah you know this guy is what i want then that's the only time that she'll consider a monogamous long-term relationship would you agree with that yeah, to an extent, to an extent, I think that I think that some of the things there, I, I might just be misunderstanding mm -hmm. um, in terms of what you're what you're trying to say. So I don't want I don't want to just I don't want to I don't want to needlessly argue on a point where I th like I, I think that men do have stronger inclinations towards multiple mating than women. Definitely. But in, yeah, we've got but, higher okay, testosterone. Okay. So we agree. Yes, we agree. Yeah. We agree. But in terms of. So that sex difference is very well supported. Uh, and, and this is from behavioral data for anyone who's, you know, really picked up on the survey data versus beha that's behavioral data, survey data, basically, however you measure, uh, however you measure it, men desire sexual variety more than women. In terms of filtering options, I think you're right that many men just don't have options. But in terms of the men compete, women choose model, when once once people are monogamous, right, which most people are doing, most people, even even the, the highest mate value males, a lot of them are just looking for monogamy. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that it's it's a one to one pairing for a, a huge portion of the market. Not all of them. There are men who are dating multiple women, obviously, and women who are mm -hmm. dating multiple men. Once there's a one to one pairing, it's like musical chairs, right? Women have to compete. That? meaning that not everybody gets a seat and you have to fight for oh, it. Okay. Yeah. So, and there's, you know, one, one seat per one, one seat per sitter. So, so it's like on that point, you know, yeah. like something else that I learned from the uh, red pill, you know, from the manosphere was that women are willing to share. Women would rather share a high value alpha than be straddled with a faithful loser. What do you think of that sound bite? Yeah, that's something that they say a lot. And it's definitely true for some women. Mm -hmm. But we would see, okay. I mean, it's the reason why a woman will date a married guy that's successful and has a family, but won't date a guy that lives in his mom's basement playing video games. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak very carefully here because I think more, I think more, I, I, we're, 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 I'm kind of over my skis in terms of where the research is on this point. Here's mm -hmm. what I say the research does support. women would rather sleep with nobody than sleep with somebody who they don't find attractive, respectable, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, I agree with that. And so what does that manifest in, right? It manifests in women competing very vigorously, right? For mates that they find actually attractive, respectable, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this will result in scenarios such as the one you're describing, where it's like they would rather, as you say, share a super high mate value guy um, than be saddled with 
as you say, a loser. Mm -hmm. But it's not that women are, that's very different from saying that, um, and this won't be true for all women, right? At all. Um, and I would say most women would, that's not the situation that they're in. Like most women, it would be the situation of like, yeah, I could share like super high mate value, but at the end of the day, he's not going to invest in me. He's not going to spend time with me. I would rather someone who's around my level, right? A little higher, a little lower. That's what most people do in practice. That's what most women do. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's between, if it's between loser and sharing high value, yeah, you're probably right. But that's not the situation for most women. No, someone yeah, that surely is. Yeah. Um, so, so that's so that, that that would be kind of my commentary on that point. Okay. Um, but I would, but I would emphasize the fact that it's not the case for most women, and most women are not content to share. Right. Like even like I was just seeing. Um, yeah, they're not. Uh, yeah, they're not happy about it, but they, but like there are some that will just look the other way. Yeah, but then, but then here's the thing, mate, is that when we're talking, we have to be, when we're talking about psychological sex differences, we have to be careful that we're identifying the actual difference and not the mm -hmm. results from that difference. Because there are plenty of men who would be happy and willing to share a high value women, but high value women don't date down for short term stuff. So they Isn't can't that do interesting it. that, you know, when you look at history, there's, there's, there's historical records of guys like Ishmael the Bloodthirsty, uh, Moroccan Sultan who ran harem of uh, thousands of women, you know, multiple wives, tons of children, but there's no historical records of women running harems of men. Yeah, that doesn't, that's, that's not, like we I mean, there are that. cases, there are cases of that, but I would mm. be pointing to those cases as, as peculiarities rather than the general trend. Have so, so yeah, so that's, that's my point is that like, so you said, um, so just to really drill down on where we're disagreeing here, because I, mm. I I think you understand uh, completely. I just want to make sure that that the audience is tracking the difference here. Is um, and I'm not saying that this is what you believe, but you said women would rather share a high value man, right, than be be one on one with a loser. It's like men would rather share a high value woman than a, a, like a very attractive supermodel type than be saddled with a loser as well. But they don't have that option ever because high value women don't date down for short term affairs. So it's right. not really so describing that it's like it's not the reality. It's not that I disagree with the reality of the statement. It's more that the emphasis is misleading because mm. it implies that you're saying something about women's psychology when really we're saying something about men's psychology. Let's um, let's move on to something else that I've noticed, you know, as well there there. There's a lot of uh, podcasts out there, which I think the media has criticized. And I think they sum it up in the titles, you know, something along the lines of, you know, making bimbos look uh, stupid. Um, and there seems to be like this general notion that women today have an overinflated ego and overinflated sense of entitlement. And they don't understand um, like the numbers, if that makes sense. So I know that this isn't really going to deal with like scientific, um, you know, research that you work on or anything, that you, you know, the electron, but do you see in what you've come across and what you do that women don't have an accurate understanding of options on the sexual marketplace? Like you'll see this, you know, for yeah, example, I, I understand, I understand exactly where what you're like you'll see a pregnant woman with three children in tow from different fathers and her occupation is stay at home mom on Tinder saying that she's looking for a guy over six foot tall with a six figure income, six inches in the pants, six pack abs, you know, the six, six, this sort of stuff. What do you think of that? Is that something that you can comment on as far as, you know, from your experience or, you know, with your yeah, research? Course. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, this is something. This is something that I could get into. This is one of my other gripes with the red pill: mm -hmm. is that a lot of it is based on personal experience, bro. And this one woman I know, this one anecdote, da 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 da. And I'm not accusing you of doing this here. I, I understand why you're why you're bringing up these points because well, I've seen been your hundreds, I've seen your thousands of like podcast guests now where they've there's clips all over the internet now. Or I like know, I've seen, but I've also seen, I've also seen your criticisms of those is that there's, and, and I think we'd agree on that. So I'm not sure if you're just playing devil's advocate right now, but this idea that am, like, yeah. like they're, they're selecting a, a specific portion that they know they they're selecting a subset of women who they know are going to say certain things. So that way I've they can push asked the Myron about that on fresh and fit years ago. And he said, no, that's an accurate representation of the women in Miami that are available to come in. I think, uh, you know what it reminds me of? Now, I wouldn't sit down 
at a coffee shop with any one of those chicks, obviously. I mean, but... here's the here's the thing. Here's the thing. When guys when guys tell me all women are like that, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I think I mean, it's it more not, it, noble it than me, it, it just is. Tells me, it just tells me more about them than I agree with you. I think like, the it's all the women it's the are like, like women, that. When women so, say, when so women say, all men is are... all women are like that, and no Walt is not okay. all women are like that. So I think that the no Walt is something that comes from, you know, like the white knighting from like the women when they'll say, not all women are like that, but all, but all women have the capacity to behave that way. So, you know, when you say like a woman can divorce rape you, you know, if you get married, so don't get married, then people pile in and be like, no, Walt, not all women are like that. There's some good women out there. Oh, fine. Yeah. But all women have the capacity to do that. You see, like those are the differences. Yeah. 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 You know, well, I mean, well, okay. Things. Okay. I mean, I guess, I guess to, to stay, to stay just on the, on the selecting certain, sure. Certain women for the podcast. It's like, um, I, I really hate that podcast trend. I, I totally understand their business model. It's like, we're going to bring in women. Who it's Jerry Springer. Are, it's Jerry Springer. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's clownish. And then I see these just frankly, unintelligent dudes in the comments, just like seeing the, the here's women a, they've never been here's a, as if they're the representatives for all women. Here's a big fat red pill for you, Mac. And so, you know, I saw that there was a, um, a gal that went on to one of these podcasts once and, you know, the standard super chats and the hate in the chat, or she's a 304 and you know, whatever, like she's a hoe, like the standard stuff, right? She's a five. She's not as hot as she thinks she is. Um, apparently these same guys that are, that are in the chat slamming, you know, the gals will then go sign up for her only fans. And these gals have seen not just, you know, the hate in the chat, but they've also increased their monthly revenue just by going on these shows. This is why they keep going on them and taking all the flack. It seems that's interesting. That makes sense from a business perspective, I suppose. Like, isn't that funny that, 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 that men behave that way where they'll, where they'll shit on a gal, but they'll also open their wallet and punch in their credit card number to see the nudes of her. I think it goes back to the women are wicked when you're not wanted that, uh, I think it's, I think that's a, that's a, that's a song lyric. Women are wicked when you're not wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like uh, a lot of these guys who are in the red pill, they're very bitter towards women because they've had massive failures or rejections from women and so they they become resentful and so they're in mm-hmm. the comment section i hate you i hate you i hate you but mm-hmm. really if they were popular with women right if they were chads they probably would have a much a much more positive if they were they would have a much more positive outlook towards the situation yeah. i hate those podcasts I, I i understand their business model i think it's exploitative um i i also think that it's you know the goal of their business model is to make individual women look silly in order to reflect badly on all women in order to make viral clips that, you know, upset people like me. So we hate watch it. Right. Mm -hmm. And they make money. Um, and then also, you know, rile up, uh, you know, incel dorks online. Um, not saying all incels are, are, are dorks. I apologize. I, I understand that some people are genuinely struggling, um, on the mating market and that's, but you know, guys who are just, you know, bitter misogynists, not necessarily Mm -hmm. just all incels. Um, that business model to me, you said it. It's like Jerry Springer, but kind of for me, it's 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 even trashier because they're trying to push a political narrative that I view as untrue. Yeah. So so in terms of um, so you don't think so that it helps. Of, but let's talk about the no. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the women's preferences thing because uh, okay. that was interesting um, and, and we kind of skipped over it. Uh, you mentioned how um, w- individual women will exhibit standards that are unrealistic. Yeah. So they'll have expect so. You know, it seems like you can have these women that are that have mutilated their bodies with tattoos, piercings, uh, like they've turned themselves into something that is like generally not conventionally attractive to most guys. Do you have to use? Look, I'm covered in tattoos and piercings, and you're yeah, I know, but you're a dude though. I think it's different with men. Like, I think that that you know, if you're a man, then tattooing yourself is a masculine pursuit. It's a masculine trait, and I think it's only recently that women have started to adopt that behavior. I'm not saying that to disparage. Uh, yeah, well, well, we can talk about we can talk about the signaling benefits of tattoos because that, yeah. that's interesting. But let's um, but let's focus in on the point is, is that you're saying that women who are they're, women they're, who are basically lower value than low they realize. value. They've shared their body with loads and loads of men, and they're holding out to be pure and looking for a guy to look past her bad choices and the results that she's got out of life, and to basically invite her into 
their life. And I mean, like you notice when you read my book, I obviously have a chapter on red flags that I think men should be attentive to when it comes to inviting women into their life on a longer term basis. And most of these women have more red flags than a Chinese communist parade, right? Like they're just a walking nightmare uh, waiting to ruin a dude's life. Um, so I think that the entitlement is real. I think that they don't have an accurate assessment of their actual uh, mate value in the sexual marketplace. And they also have a expectation as well, it seems, that there's a lot of, like, there's some geeks out there that created this website. I think it's called I Got Standards Bro. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, is it is it like the is it the standards calculator? It's the, it's like, um, I think it's called the height, female the female delusion calculator. And you yeah, you put in, in like height, you put foot. in money, you put in exactly. all the things that you're looking for, and then it shows you. Oh, it's and actually zero point zero one percent. Yeah, and then the it collects the demographic yeah. data and it spits out a number like you know one yeah, yeah, percent yeah. of the population. So yeah. there's not a lot of guys out there, and women will go. That's okay. I'll just wait. Right. Like, what do you think of that notion with the sexes? Because aren't men and women better together than they are apart? Like. This like this environment that we're in right now when it comes with current mating strategies is very, very difficult. I think it's harder than any other time in history, yeah. if I'm being honest, right? So some women, yeah, we could talk about that as well. God, so much to get into. But I will say that, look, some women, it's true, are going to have unrealistic standards. And these shows are going to illustrate those women, right? Shine a light on them. But I would encourage you to look at the comments and see how unrealistic the standards are of the followers of these shows, right? They're there mostly are these men, guys, but I mean, you don't know who they are. These men, no, these men are like, oh, I'm holding out for, you know, a virgin trad wife who's beautiful and fit and young and all this kind of stuff. These guys it's just like, talk though, Mac. And you it's, know, it's like, just talk like, who are they? Show me your yeah, face. That, well, Show me what, what you do saying. for a that's living. What I'm saying. That's what I'm saying is that that's the male version of the same phenomenon. It it's is. like, and, right. and, and yeah. you see the same, I see the same thing in the comments like, um, like, oh, I, you know, I'm an alpha, I'm a high va value male, da, 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 da. And it's like, you sound exactly the same, bro. It's like your, your standards are so high, but you can't, you don't, you bring nothing to the table as a male. You can't afford to have those standards. Well, so I find honest, it, I mean, if you're a, a top shelf man, like if you're in the top 1%, you're not watching shows like that. You've, I mean, you're doing you something different time. in your life. No. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I completely agree. So I would say that, yes, some people have to have too high standards on the mating market. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't make it a gendered thing because it's like I see men who are doing the same thing. I would also, I would but also. But when we talked earlier about men encourage... prioritizing availability, don't they do that? Yeah. So let, yeah. So so women generally, you're right that women generally are pickier than men. But there are a lot of men who are doing the exact same behavior that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that as like a oh look at the anecdote to prove the rule. I'm I'm saying that at a general level, especially in these environs. It's mostly. So let's talk like about it. Let's talk about shit. it. Let's talk about it though at a more. Uh, Let's look at this from a sing signaling perspective, right? Sometimes when people are struggling on the mating market, they pretend that it's because their standards are so high <laughs> and they're waiting. But in okay. reality, they've got nobody, right? So a woman might say, oh, I only date guys over six feet. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, where are the 5'11 guys waiting to date you? You're saying that because you're trying to distract from the fact that you don't have any options. So you're pretending so is that, that your standards are so high. Then on yeah, the other so end, just stop there for a sec. Then on the other end with men, sec. we see the same thing. Let me just stop same. there for a sec. So yeah, yeah. isn't that isn't that when you know when like the red pill or the man of swamp says, watch what women do, don't listen to what they say? Isn't that but I've been advice? saying that I've been saying that the whole show. I've been saying ever since you brought up the survey again with the survey, did it's like I'm saying I'm saying that a lot of times we have to look at behaviors, behavioral data, right? Actual okay. things like that, not just what people say. Okay, so, so you're all, all about watching the behavior then? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 of course. A lot of times the survey data is informative because sometimes it reflects genuine psychology. Mm. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you need... So, 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 But what I'm saying is that there's a benefit to saying that you have high standards because one, it signals... It's a positive signal of mate value, right? It's implying, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, look at me. Like I, I can actually make choices here. So it's mm -hmm. creating the illusion that you have high mate value, whether, whether that's effective or not in specific cases, hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like these, like guys like Myron Gaines being like on, on, on fresh and fit saying, oh, she needs to be, you know, she needs to be feminine. She needs to be um, beautiful. She needs to be subservient, all this kind of stuff. And he's saying, he's setting this like incredibly high bar for what he wants in a relationship. He's acting like he's very picky. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I mean, I, I don't know about his specific case, but for a lot of men, they say the same kind of things. And it's to mask the fact that no woman wants them.
And the same thing on the other side with women saying, oh, I, I only date guys over six feet. It's like, okay, well, there are no guys who are 5'11 who are trying to date you. So you're just hiding the fact that you don't necessarily have options by pretending that you have very high standards. If a guy who was 5'9 came up to you and he was handsome and funny and you got along, you wouldn't care whether he was six foot or not. So it's just, it's just, the, it's just the illusion. And there's a couple signaling benefits. One is that it makes you seem higher mate value. Two is that it, it you know... It, it, it signals that maybe your problems are actually the result of, of you know, your standards as opposed to um, as opposed to your lack of opportunity. So the, 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 that's what I'd say on that point is that it's not really a gendered thing. We, we see it in both sexes and you have to think of it from a signaling perspective. Let me ask you a question about something that you stated in um, that podcast that we were chatting about when we opened. Um, you said that you. Uh, I mean, the. Uh, the clip was titled uh, Red Pill Advice is Garbage. And I think that the criticism that you had was um, th that that men in their 20s are advised not to date. And you thought that that was because um, the red pill guys were disqualifying uh, men from the sexual marketplace so they could have access to the women. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I wasn't totally clear on that. Yeah. So this is actually, this is something that I see actually... So oftentimes we talk about the watch what they say, not what they do. Yeah. Oftentimes when I'm listening to people speak, I'm thinking of the signaling benefits to the speaker rather than the contents of their speech. Where did you, you hear that, by the way? Like, who did you hear say that? It, it's not, well, it, it comes from... I don't know if you remember. I think Jeffrey Miller is the person who really influenced me on that in terms of Jeffrey signaling. Miller is in your camp, isn't he? He's one of the Evo site guys. Um, yes. Yeah, so Primer. Talks... Uh, what's, what's his handle? Uh, Primal Poly. I mean, Primal Poly. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I've had him on my podcast, but I think he yeah. was, I, I think uh, you're asking where, why I started getting interested in signaling theory. No, no. And... I was talking about where you heard, like, heard the advice that these um, Mano Swamp guys are telling guys in their 20s not to date, and you think it's because you want them to disqualify men from the sexual marketplace mm. so they have access yeah. to these women, if I understood it correctly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. So okay, I see. Because I, see. I, have said, I have said that guys in their 20s should not get into a long-term relationship but should date. Yeah, right? yeah, you've said that. Yeah, yeah. So, so guys like, um, I believe his name is, Jay Waller or Justin Waller? Justin Waller. Okay, yeah. So, so he has said, for example, don't date, don't in, date, your don't date in your twenties. That kind of thing. Well, that's right? stupid advice. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And then your thing on don't get into a long term relationship in your twenties. I would also disagree with that. To I be would, honest, I would, I would build on that and say don't jump into a long term relationship in your twenties. Right? Like, there's, there's vetting that needs to be done. There's groundwork okay. you need to set for your life. And I yeah. think that guys okay. can wait until later on in their lives you know if they're going to have an ltr or raise a family or, or yeah. have children they don't have the same timeline that women have right yeah you've also said though that yeah they don't they don't but but and this is another area of disagreement with us is that i've heard okay. you say in a couple of TikToks that you believe that men peak in their late 30s yeah Can i would say that there are a lot of guys that i know that that have reached their uh sexual market peak 37, 38, 39, 40. I mean, I know a guy that's 42. That's just, he's insane. Like he's got really good genetics. He's loaded. He doesn't want to settle down. He's got lots of women in his life. When do you think the average guy can expect to be peak mate value? Well, I mean like the average, the average guy never peaks, you know, for being honest, you know, the average guy just kind of like sleepwalks through life and a lonely misery of, of very average women that don't really complement their life. Like that is the average guy's life. It's, it's, it's not good. Um, but when do you I think, think when you, you, well, what age do you think the average guy is going to have the most options? Because I, I think we, I think if the average guy does, does the work on himself, uh, chases excellence, becomes competent, is captivating, um, is, has like, I know that you get this because you are a boxer and you've competed in an arena. I have a lot of respect for any man that will put his chin on the line, um, and stare down another man in a fight because, I think that's an important skill and a, and a rite of passage for for a lot of guys. So I think guys should be doing stuff like this to build build the foundation and build the bricks of what a man truly is, right? Like what a good man is and what uh, 
Um, you know, Jack Donovan talks about this a lot in his books, you know, the way of men and becoming a barbarian, you know, where you have good men and men that are good at being men. And that's my gripe with the Mano Swamp is I look at it and I see there's not a lot of good men and there's not a lot of men that are good at being men in that space, which is why I don't associate with, with it anymore. But I think that guys, if they do the work on themselves, mid thirties, late thirties is entirely plausible for you to be at your peak. Um, whereas with women, they can look very, very attractive in, you know, their late thirties, even forties. I mean, there's even 50 year old women out there. They're very attractive, but they're not as hot as their 23 year old self. And when you survey men, and I know that you've done the research on this or you've at least read it, most, most, in fact, all men, when you survey them, on a balance of probabilities, we'll select about 22, 23 as the most beautiful woman. And, you know, if you show them 20 to all the way to 70, generally speaking, it's early 20s, they tend to pick as the most beautiful. So men and women do have different timelines is what I believe, but you don't think that's true? You think that men peak differently? Oh, I no, we 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 agree on some of the things you said there. I'll, I'll okay. note on the boxing, it's kind of funny. We 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 disagree on so many things that I was I was on the phone to my girlfriend last night. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just telling her, I was like, oh, this kind of, you know, I have to go on a podcast tomorrow where I disagree with the guy on a lot of things. It's kind of reminding yeah. me of boxing a little bit. I yeah. miss boxing every day, every single day. I, I, I've, I had, about it. I've had one fight and I loved it. I mean, I would do it again, but I've been training for like three and a half, four years. So I get it, right? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Good for you. Yeah. No, I used to, I used to compete, I compete, um, all through that's my, that's my childhood. When I think of my childhood, I just think about fighting. Um, yeah. the competitive fighting was so fun. I mean, it probably took, it took away a few brain cells, um, but worth, worth every single one, mm -hmm. at least so far. And, uh, you know, and it gears you up for life so well, because the truth is that people say like, Oh, you know, you're scared. You're scared to talk to a red pill guy. You're scared to talk to a red pill guy. I'm like, he's not going to hit me. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm just gonna, I'm going to get on the phone with Rich and we're going to have some disagreements and, you know, maybe it's going to get a little tense at some points, but he's not going to smack me in the face, you know, and I've been smacked in the face probably 2000 times mm -hmm. uh, throughout, throughout my life. <laughs> so, so I'm not, so I'm not worried about it. Um, so, but in any case, the sexual market peak, like what, what do you think that meant? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for me, again, it's about looking at behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. So I agree with you that for some men, especially if they're, you know, career maxing as, as an incel might say, um, you know, they, maybe, maxing. maybe they do. Yeah. Maybe they do peak later, but here's just the cold reality of it. And it's not, and I think a lot of, a lot of these guys in the red pill space, they're in their late twenties, they're in their early thirties. Right. And they haven't, you know, they haven't really succeeded with women yet. And so they're telling themselves this story. I'm not saying you're doing this. You're obviously, you know, at, at a different stage in life, but they're telling this themselves the story. Oh, the best days are yet to come. The best mm -hmm. days are yet to come. And it's like, mate, the best days already passed you by. Like if you look at, if you look at when women peak in terms of their, in terms of, you would say their sexual market value, I would say mate value. I would say that a variety of evidence converges on it being um, in their twenties, at least mm -hmm. in terms of when men and, and this is when men, not going off of what people say, it's just when do men compete most intensely over mates, right? And it's over that group of mates. It's women in their 20s, right? I'm not saying yeah. that this is how I want the world to be, right? I'm just saying from a cold, apathetic reading of the data, this is, this is when female mate value or women's mate value seems to peak in our species. Who do these women select? These are the women with the most selective power. They can choose whoever they want to be with. Who do they select? They select other men in their 20s. Mm -hmm. When they're going on a dating app, they're most of them are filtering out men over 30, let alone men in their late 30s. Okay. That's true. But they do get to a point at some point where they realize that a lot of these younger guys aren't doing it for them. And then they start some to expand do. that 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 uh reach yep. maybe like you know instead of three years older it goes to five years older maybe seven years older maybe yep. 10 years older yeah yeah but even it's not then, entirely even then, uncommon well, let's take for 10, women let's in take their 20s to date you know older guys right yeah no, no no older is normal older is older but hey cope aside right you know red pill guys coping i mean we're talking about uncomfortable truths mm. right uncomfortable truth is that men also peak relatively young Right. In terms of when are men most physically attractive? And you talk a lot about genuine desire, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these red pill guys talk about genuine desire. It's like <laughs> genuine desire as a man, you're going to be much more likely to get that when you're in your 20s, when you're actually as physically attractive as you get. So this is this is 
I don't know, man. I've had, you know, I've had genuine burning desire, you know, throughout my life many times. And it's, oh, I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. We're talking like it's about, it's not confusing. We're talking about the average. Yeah. We're, we're talking, we're not talking about you. We're talking about the average guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so, so like you, I would so, completely agree that I was better looking and, you know, like money didn't like, you know, I've said this before too. So maybe you could comment on, on this. Women have a lot more patience for a hot guy in his 20s that has a plan versus a guy that's 40 that might be good looking, but has nothing to show for himself and still has a plan. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's true. That's true. Like I mean, we're, we're women we're, have we're, the expectation that men do something of some significance with their life as they sort of move through it. Yes, I, I agree with that. I guess I just want to really drill down on this point. The women with the most, so a lot of red pill guys say, oh, men peak in their thirties, men peak in their late thirties, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you say this, but you know, if you go on fresh and fit, they're like, yeah, it just keeps getting better and better for men throughout their thirties. Yeah, it's like, like, all right, if let's you do go, the let, work, but for most guys, no. Yeah. Most it's like, let's go to the, lives. let's go to the data, right? Women who are, you know, 23, 24, 25, who can choose to date whoever they want. It's like, who do they choose to date? They choose to date men who are 25, 26, 27, right? Mm -hmm. 30 is pushing it. They'll do it. 30 is pushing it. Let's say, even as you say, 10 year age gap, right? That, that was the biggest age gap that you mentioned mm -hmm. in terms of dating app filters. That would be an uncommonly, just so you know, from a data perspective, mm -hmm. most, most young women are not trying to date men 10 years older than them. Some will. I mean, I know some will, um, especially if, you know, a man brings a lot to the table, but for the most part, it's like even 10 years, like that's 23 to 33, mm -hmm. right? That's not 38. Right. So this cope, this fantasy, this, this, this story that red pill guys who haven't succeeded with women the way they expect to, this story they keep chattering on to themselves like, oh, the promised land is coming. You know, when I get older, yeah, I mean, when I get older, like, and you're it's absolutely like, no, right. mate, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But like the truth is, I is that fully agree the, with you, Mac. The best looking, the you best 100%. looking young, the best looking young women, yeah. the best looking young women are interested in the best looking young men. That's but, the primary, that's the primary place of mating competition. And you I'm know, these, you the you know, these here, guys, I'm going to give you the butt here, which is like, which is like the outlier, which is what we're talking about. You know, when we're saying that men peak later, um, you mentioned just, that might be Waller. what you're saying. That's not what that, you, that might be what you're saying. That's not hear me out though. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, Justin Waller. So I know who he is, obviously. Um, I don't know what his age is. I think he's in his late thirties. Let's call him 38. I would say. Yeah, probably. Maybe, when he was younger, forced. he was kind of fat and dorky. And, you know, he did something with his life, got some style going, um, you know, built a, a business, made some money, improved his network, you know, surround himself with higher value guys. Um, arguably, he is of a higher sexual market value at his current age today than what he would have been at 23. So I think the yeah, argument that's, that's, that's made there is, guys, don't sweat it. You're not getting the results that you want right now. I know you want a 10. I got it. You know, you got a lot of testosterone and you want to chase gals, but work on yourself, invest in yourself. Like that's the messaging that I try to convey anyway. Right. It's like, look, you may not be getting what you want right now, but I'm not saying the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. If you do the fucking work, you know, the best is yet to come. If you fix your deficiencies, if you become captivating, if you develop a strong network, you know, if you do all the things that I tell guys, you know, to do in their lives, then they can still get what their uh, hopes, dreams, and wants are at 38, right? Whereas women, they don't have that same timeline. They don't have that same luxury, right? I think that women need to prioritize um, if they're serious about having a family and raising children and that sort of stuff and getting a solid guy in their life at a much younger age. I think it's important for them to contemplate that. So I think the conversations that you have with a son versus a daughter are very different. I think the conversation you have as a son with his son, make something out of yourself chase excellence, do the work, you know, increase your value to as high as you can possibly make it. So you are spoiled for choice as a man and you can get what you want out of this life. And daughter, preserve your value. Don't run around and share your body with a bunch of guys. Don't go and tattoo it up. Don't go and dye your hair purple and do stupid things with your life. Preserve your value and preserve your purity because that's what men, you know, of high value are looking for. Um, you know, I had this conversation once where it's like, you know, well, what should I be doing as a woman? You know, I'd be telling, you know what, I'd be telling my daughter, Go and get a job selling jets, high-end uh, cars, selling yachts, and you will be exposed to very successful men. Date one of them, you know, and get yourself sorted out that way. That would be a great way, I think, you know, for a woman to sort of get what she wants out of her life instead of climbing the corporate ladder and chasing degrees. Because in the well, West, you know, family law protects women. 
Yeah, but surely, surely you understand that it's not all just mating. Like we can talk about, you know, mating goals and things like that. But surely you know that. I mean, I, 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 I just know that you know this. That like, like in the same way that men have dreams for themselves and dreams mm-hmm. for what they want to achieve in life, uh, women have those dreams as well. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened in my video. I'm like, oh, you know, I think my camera overheated. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. I I've, still hear I've, you. I've never had my camera go this long that it overheated. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Hold on yeah, a second. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can switch watch. over here. Um, yeah. You know what? We're almost at the two hour mark and I wanted to wrap it up. And I know That's that we fine. can probably go on for three or four hours. So maybe we'll do a, a part two. Um, this might yeah, be we'll do a follow. To, yeah, this might be my cue to sort of wrap it up. Um, <laughs> so there's a whole bunch more we could talk about, Mac. And I really appreciate you joining me. I think I should... Uh, check you out and at least hear your perspective on these things. You got a uh, TikTok. Where would you want to sell people, uh, sorry, send people to, to follow your uh, content and the stuff that you're building? Yeah. I wish I had something to sell. I really don't. Um, yeah. So just Google me. Um, everything's free. And then also keep in mind, it's like, I know that, I know that a lot of guys, you guys are hearing what I'm saying and thinking that I'm just coming from in some, some insane, I, I know because I've, I've heard from you red pill guys that you think that I'm like just incredibly biased. Da, 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 da. I promise you, I know it's tough to believe, but I genuinely just look at the data and it's like, okay, what's the mainstream take on this from a scientific perspective, the most plausible outcome, right? Not what I want to be true. I've said plenty of uncomfortable truths today. Just what seems most likely to be true. And that, and that runs through all of my work and you can see that for yourself. Closing thought. You still think I'm a sexist? I think that I think that a lot of the things you say are, um, but I, I don't know you in my personal life, and I wouldn't I would not go that far. Cool. All right, man. Um, really appreciate you coming on and uh, diving in this conversation. It's been a slice, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll do it again. Um, we'll talk briefly after I end the show off the air. But uh, thanks for watching, guys. You know, do the thing, like and comment below, and all that good stuff. And we'll see you guys very soon. Peace out.